On the Beach by Neville Shute Lieutenant Commander Peter Holmes of the Royal Australian Navy woke soon after dawn. He woke happy, and it was some time before he realized why. He had a date at eleven o'clock in the second naval member's office in the Navy Department up in Melbourne. It meant a new appointment, his first work for five months. It could even mean a seagoing job and he ached for a ship again. Mary stirred beside him and sat up, and the baby started chuntering and making little whimpering noises. He and Mary had been married in 1961, six months before the war, before he sailed in Her Majesty's Australian ship Anzac for what they thought would be indefinite separation. The short, bewildering war had followed, the war of which no history had been written, or ever would be written now that had fled all round the northern hemisphere and had died away with the last seismic record of explosion on the thirty-seventh day. At the end of the third month, he had returned to Williamstown in Anzac on the last of her fuel oil, while the statesmen of the southern hemisphere gathered in conference at Wellington in New Zealand to compare notes and assess the new conditions, had returned to Falmouth to his Mary and his Morris Minor, the first car he had ever owned, and in which he had courted Mary. That was before it dawned upon Australia that all oil came from the Northern Hemisphere. Peter travelled to the city immersed in speculations about his new appointment, for the paper famine had closed down all the daily newspapers, and news came now by radio alone. The Royal Australian Navy was a very small fleet now. Seven small ships had been converted from oil burners to most unsatisfactory coal burners at great cost and effort. An attempt to convert the aircraft carrier Melbourne had been suspended when it proved that she would be too slow to allow the aircraft to land with safety. In fact, the fleet air arm had virtually ceased to exist. He had not heard of any changes in the offices of the seven ships that remained in commission. He got to the city in about an hour, and made his way to the Navy Department, and was shown into the Admiral's office. Good morning, Lieutenant Commander. Sit down. Got a seagoing appointment for you. I'm posting you as liaison officer in USS Scorpion. I understand you've met Commander Towers. Yes, sir. He had met the captain of Scorpion two or three times in the last few months. A quiet, soft-spoken man of thirty-five or so, with a slight New England accent. He had read the American's report upon his ship's war service. Towers had been at sea in his atomic-powered submarine on patrol when the war began. On the fourth day, he had come to periscope depths for an inspection of the empty sea, as was his routine in each watch of the daylight hours, and found the visibility to be extremely low, apparently with some sort of dust. At the same time, the detector on his periscope indicated a high level of radioactivity. He attempted to report this to Pearl Harbor, but got... No reply. On the seventh day of the war, he was in Manila Bay. Visibility was moderate, and through his periscope he saw a pall of smoke drifting up above the city and formed the opinion that at least one nuclear explosion had taken place there within the last few days. That night he failed again to raise an American station, but he established radio contact with an Australian station at Port Moresby in New Guinea. Here he learned for the first time of the Russian-Chinese war that had flared up out of the Russian-NATO war that had in turn been born of the Israeli-Arab war initiated by Albania and the use of cobalt bombs. It seemed to him that the best thing he could do would be to go south and set course for Yap Island, a cable station under the control of the United States. He got there three days later. Six days later, still unable to make contact with any station in the United States or Europe, he decided to sail his ship to Australia and to place it under Australian command. That was a year ago. USS Scorpion proved to be the only vessel in Australian waters with any worthwhile radius of action, so she was sailed to Williamstown, the naval dockyard of Melbourne. She was, in fact, the only warship in Australia worth bothering about. She had stayed idle for some months while her nuclear fuel was prepared, and had then made a cruise to Rio de Janeiro, 
carrying supplies of fuel for another American nuclear submarine, USS Swordfish, that had taken refuge there. The appointment was a new one, and the thought of Mary and his little daughter troubled Peter and prompted him to ask how long it was for. The Admiral shrugged. At the conclusion of this refit on the 4th, that's in a little over a week from now, the ship is to proceed to Cairns, Port Moresby and Port Darwin, to, to report upon conditions in those places returning to Williamstown. Commander Towers estimates 11 days for that cruise. After that, we have in mind a longer cruise, lasting perhaps two months. Would there be an interval between those cruises, huh? Well, I should think the ship might be in dockyard for about a fortnight. Peter sat and thought for a moment. If the second cruise began about the middle of February, he would be home by the middle of April. I should be all right for those two cruises, sir. Would it be possible to review the situation after that? It's not easy to make plans ahead with all this going on. I can do that. I'll make this posting for five months till the 31st of May. Report to me again when you get back from the second cruise. Very good, sir. You report to Scorpion on Tuesday, New Year's Day. The Admiral rose and held out his hand. Good luck in the appointment. Peter paused before leaving the room and asked, As I'm here, I might slip down and make my number with Commander Towers. Do you know if he's on board today? So far as I know, I asked my secretary to put a call through to the Sydney. Peter walked down to the berth occupied by HMAS Sydney, an aircraft carrier immobilized at the quayside. He went on board and down to the great wardroom. There were only about a, a dozen officers there, six of them in the khaki, gabardine working uniform of the U.S. Navy. The captain of Scorpion was among them. He came forward smiling to meet Peter. Say, Lieutenant Commander, I'm glad you could come down. He introduced Peter to the other officers and said, How about a drink before lunch, Commander? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll have a pink chin. The captain pressed the bell. How many officers have you in Scorpion, sir? Eleven, all told. She's quite a submarine, of course, and we carry four engineer officers. The wardroom steward came in. The captain said, Will you bring one pink gin and uh, six orange aids? Peter was embarrassed and could have kicked himself for his indiscretion. He checked the steward. Don't you drink in port, sir? The captain smiled. Why, no, uh... Uncle Sam doesn't like it, but you, you, you go right ahead. This is a British ship. I'd rather have it your way. Um, seven orange aids. They lunched in Sydney, and then went down into Scorpion, moored alongside. She was the biggest submarine Peter had ever seen. She displaced about 6,000 tons, and her atomic-powered turbines developed well over 10,000 horsepower. Besides her 11 officers, she carried a crew of about 70 petty officers and enlisted men. Peter spent some time looking over the submarine before returning to the captain's tiny cabin. Commander Towers rang for coffee, and when it came, they sipped in silence for a while. Then Peter said, My orders are to report to you on Tuesday. What time would you like me here, sir? Well, we sail on Tuesday on sea trials. We're taking on stores on Monday, and the crew come aboard. I'd better report to you on Monday, then. Sometime in the morning? That might be a good thing. I think we'll get away by Tuesday noon. I told the Admiral I'd like to uh, take a little cruise in Bass Strait as a shakedown and come back maybe on Friday and report operational readiness. Are you going away for the weekend? No, I'll, I'll stick around. Maybe go up to the city one day and take in a movie. On impulse, Peter said, Would you care to come down to Falmouth for a couple of nights, sir? We've got a spare bedroom. We spent... Most of our time at the sailing club this weather, swimming and sailing. My wife would like it if you could come. Well, that's mighty nice of you, the captain said thoughtfully. Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere people seldom mix now. Too great a difference of experience lay between them, and the intolerable sympathy made a barrier. But it might be awkward if he refused an invitation kindly meant from his new officer. You sure it wouldn't be too much for your wife? She'd like it, Peter said again. Make a bit of a change for her. She doesn't see many new faces with things as they are. The baby makes a tie as well. well. I certainly would like to come down for one night. How would it be if I came down to Falmouth on the train on Saturday morning? I'll have to be back here on Sunday. I'll meet you at the station. 
Can you ride a pushback? We live about two miles out. Commander Towers nodded. Peter got back to Falmouth about six o'clock to find Mary Cole in a summer frock and the refreshing murmur of a sprinkler on the lawn. She came to meet him. What happened about the appointment, good or bad? Oh, good. See going until April, nothing after that. Oh, Peter, that's perfect. Go and have a shower and then tell me about it. Quarter of an hour later, sitting in the shade with a cold beer, he gave her the details. At the end he said, I've asked um, Commander Towers down for the weekend. He's coming on Saturday morning. She stared at him in consternation. Oh, Peter, you know it's too painful for them, coming into other people's homes. He tried to reassure her. He'll be all right. It's only for one night. He says he's got to be back on Scorpion on Sunday. She sat and thought, frowning. We'll have to find him plenty to do, keep him occupied all the time. What does he like doing? He wants to have a swim. Sailing. There's a race on Saturday. Oh, I should think he sells he sort of man who would. We have to do something with him in the evening. Oh, we could have a party. I believe um, Moira Davidson would come and help us out, she said thoughtfully, if she isn't doing anything else. Oh, that's not a bad idea if she isn't drunk. I should tell her right out what she's got to do, never a dull moment. They rang Moira that evening and put the proposition to her. All right, I'll come over on Saturday morning. By the way, I've given up gin. It's brandy now. You can drink a lot of brandy. On Saturday morning, Peter rode down to found the station on his push bike and met Moira. She was a slightly built girl with straight blonde hair and a white face, the daughter of a grazier with a small property at a place called Harkaway near Berwick. She arrived at the station in a very smart four-wheel trap, snatched from some junkyard and reconditioned at considerable expense a year before, with a good-looking, high-spirited grey mare between the shafts. She was wearing slacks of the brightest red and a shirt of the same colour, with lips, fingernails and toenails to match. They met Commander Towers on the platform, and Peter made the introductions. As they walked down the ramp, the American said, I haven't ridden a bicycle in years. I'll probably fall off. Well, we're doing better for you than that, Peter said. Moira's got a jinker here. The other wrinkled his brow. I didn't get that. Sports car, the girl said. New model, only one horsepower. When the American saw the jinker, he exclaimed. Say, this is quite a buggy you've got. Moira laughed. A buggy? That's the word for it. Get up and I'll show you how she goes. I've got my bike here, sir, Peter said. I'll ride that and meet you at the house. Commander Towers climbed up and the girl got up beside him. She turned the grey and trotted up the road behind the bicycle. Before we leave town, she told her companion, I'm going to have a drink. Peter's a dear and Mary too. They don't drink enough. Hope you don't mind. You can have a Coke or something if you'd rather. The commander felt a little dazed, but refreshed. It was a long time since he'd had to deal with this sort of young woman. I'll go along with you. I've swallowed enough cokes in the last year to float my ship periscope depth. I could use a drink. Then that's two of us. She stared her outfit into the main street and drew up outside the pier hotel. She tied the reins to the bumper of an abandoned car and went with her companion into the ladies' lounge. He asked, What can I order for you? Double brandy. Water? Just a little. A lot of ice. I guess I'll stick to whiskey. When he returned with the drinks, she asked, What's your name? Dwight. Dwight Lionel. I'm Moira Davidson. We've got a grazing property about 20 miles from here. You're the captain of the submarine, aren't you? What do you do when you're on leave? Do you play golf? Sail a boat? Go fishing? Fishing, mostly. Commander Holmes said something about a swim. Well, that's easy. There's a sailing race this afternoon down at the club. Is that your line? Certainly is. What kind of boat does he have? There's a thing called Gwen 12. I don't know if he wants to sail it himself. I'll crew for you if he doesn't. If we're going sailing, we'd better stop drinking. I'm not going to crew for you if you're going to be all U.S. Navy. Our ships aren't dry like yours. Okay, he said equably. Then I'll crew for you. She stared at him. Has anyone ever bashed you over the head with a bottle? He smiled. 
Lots of times. Come on. I want to see the world from that jinker. He stared it towards the door. It's a baggy. No, it's not. We're in Australia now. It's a jinker. That's where you're wrong. It's a baggy, an Abbott buggy. It's over 70 years old. Daddy said it was built in America. He looked at it with new interest. Say, I was wondering where I'd seen it before. My grandpa had one just like it in the woodshed up in Maine when I was a boy. She mustn't let him think about the past. She swung herself up into the driving seat and tweaked the mare's mouth cruelly. The mare pawed with her forefeet and then dashed off in a canter. The American sat, clinging to his seat as they careered out of town. They came to the Holmes's house a few minutes later with a grey and a lather of sweat. Their hosts came out to meet them. Sorry we're late, Mary, the girl said coolly. I couldn't get Commander Towers past the pub. Peter remarked, Looks like you've been making up lost time. We had quite a ride. Commander turned to the girl. How would it be if I walk her up and down a little till she cools off? Fine. I should unharness her and put her in the paddock. Peter will show you. Peter Dwight um, wants to sail your boat this afternoon. I never said that, the American protested. But you do. She eyed the horse, glad that her father wasn't there to see. Give her a rub down or something. I'll give her a drink later. That afternoon... Mary stayed at home with the baby, quietly preparing for the evening party. Dwight rode on steadily with Peter and Moira to the sailing club on bicycles. The boat was a sealed plywood box with a small cockpit and an efficient spread of sail. They rigged and launched her and got to the starting line with five minutes to spare. The commander had never sailed a boat of that particular type before, but she handled well, and he had confidence in her by the time the gun went. As is the case on Port Phillip Bay, the wind blew up very quickly. A gust came down on them and laid the vessel over. The girl played down and pulled the jib sheet in, and the boat gave up and laid her sails flat upon the water. She said accusingly, You held on to the main sheet. Oh, hell, my bra's coming off. Here, help me get it on. That's right. Good hard knot. Now let's get this boat up and get on with the race. Marveling at her effrontery, he bore his weight down on the plate with her, and the boat came upright with a rush. In a minute, they were underway again. They completed the course without further incident, finishing last but one. They sailed into the beach, and Peter met them. Have a good sail, he asked. I saw you bottle her. It's been a lovely sail, the girl replied. Never a dull moment. She goes beautifully, Peter. They pulled the boat ashore and let down the sails. Then they bathed off the end of the jetty and sat smoking in the warm evening sun. Moira said, When do we start drinking again, Peter? The crowd is coming in about eight o'clock, he turned to his guest. Got a few people coming in this evening. I thought we'd go down and have dinner at the hotel first. Eases the strain on the domestic side. They were back from the hotel, changed and ready to meet the guests at eight o'clock. Four couples came to the modest little party, and for three hours they danced and drank together, sedulously avoiding any serious topic of conversation. Finally, at about half-past eleven, Mary brought in a tray of tea and buttered scones and cakes, the universal signal in Australia that the party was coming to an end. When the guests had gone, Moira and Dwight went out on the veranda. Certainly nice to sit quiet for a while, he said. After a short pause, she asked, Why is Peter joining you in Scorpion? He's our new liaison officer. Did you have one before? He shook his head. Why have they given you one now? She paused and asked. Is it true that Cairns is out, Dwight? I think it is. Cairns, Darwin, and Port Mosby. Maybe we'll have to go and see. Maybe that's uh, why Peter has been drafted to Scorpion. He knows those waters. This radiation sickness is going on spreading southwards till it gets to us. That's what they say. Can't anything be done to stop it? He shook his head. Not a thing. It's the winds. It's mighty difficult to dodge what's carried on the wind. I don't understand it. People were once saying that no wind blows across the equator, so we'd, we'd be all right. It's not so difficult to understand, really, and 
In each hemisphere, the winds go round in great whorls, thousands of miles across between the pole and the equator. There's a circulatory system of winds in the northern hemisphere and another in the southern hemisphere. But what divides them isn't the equator that you see on a globe. It's a thing called the pressure equator, and that shifts north and south with the season. In January, the whole of Borneo and Indonesia is in the northern system, but in July, the division has shifted away up north so that all of India and Siam and everything that's to the south of that is in the southern system. So in January, the northern winds carry the radioactive dust from the fallout down into Malaya, say. Then in July, that's in the southern system, and uh, our own winds pick it up and carry it down here. That's why it's coming to us so slowly. It's not fair. No one in the southern hemisphere ever dropped a bomb, a hydrogen bomb or a cobalt bomb or any sort of bomb. We had nothing to do with it. Why should we have to die because other countries nine or ten thousand miles away wanted to have a war? It's so bloody unfair. Is that all right? There was a pause, and then she said angrily, It's not that I'm afraid of dying. We all have to do that sometime. It's all the things I'm going to have to miss. She got restlessly to her feet. Get me another drink, right? He smiled up at her. Not on your life. It's time you went to bed. Then I'll get it for myself. She marched angrily into the house and came out almost immediately, a tumbler more than half full in her hand. I was going home in March, she exclaimed, to London. It's been arranged for years. I was to have six months in England and on the continent, and then I was coming back through America. She took a long gulp at her glass and held it away from her in disgust. Christ, what's this muck I'm drinking? He took the glass from her and smelt it. That's, uh, whiskey. So it is. It'll probably kill me on top of brandy, she said, and tossed off the rest of the neat liquor. She faced him unsteady in the starlight. I'll never have a family like Mary, she muttered. Even if you took me to bed tonight, I'd, I'd, I'd never have a family because there wouldn't be time. She laughed hysterically. It's really damn funny. Mary was afraid you'd start bursting into tears when you saw the baby and nappies on the line. Her words began to slur. Keep him occupied, that's what she said. Never a dull moment. The tears began to trickle down her cheeks. She never thought it would be me who'd do the crying. She collapsed by the veranda in a torrent of tears. The commander hesitated for a minute uncertain what to do. Then he turned and went to find Mary. Ah, uh, Mrs. Holmes, he said a little diffidently. Miss Davidson has just drunk a full glass of neat whiskey on top of brandy. I think she might want somebody to put her to bed. Next morning, Commander Towers put in an appearance at about quarter to nine with a fresh, scrubbed look about him. It was a nice party you had last night, he said. I don't know when I enjoyed one so much. Like another swim this morning, Peter said. Looks like being another hot day. Dwight hesitated. I rather like to go to church on Sunday morning. It's what we do at home. Would there be a Church of England church around here any place? That's just down the hill, about three quarters of a mile away. Service is at eleven o'clock. The little church was very like the church in his own town, in Mystic, Connecticut. He'd even smelt the same, and in its tranquility he set himself to think about his family. He was, essentially, a very simple man. He would be going back to them in September, home from his travels. He would see them all again in less than nine months' time. They must not feel, when he rejoined them, that he was out of touch or that he had forgotten things that were important in their lives. Junior must have grown quite a bit. Kids did at that age. It was time he had a fishing rod, a little fiberglass spinning rod. His birthday was July the 10th. Helen would be six on April the 17th. He must think of something to take to her. Sharon would explain that Daddy was away at sea and make it all right with her. He walked out of the church at the end of the service, mentally refreshed. At the house, he found Mary and Moira sitting in deck chairs on the veranda, the baby in her pram beside them. You found the church all right, Mary said. Why, yes. You've got a mighty fine congregation. There wasn't a seat vacant. 
Wasn't always like that. Let me get you a drink. I'd like something soft. He eyed their glasses. What's uh, that you're drinking? Moira replied, lime juice and water. All right, don't say it. He laughed. I'd uh, like one of those too. Mary went off to get it for him. Moira said, Mary says you're going back to Williamstown this afternoon. Can't you stay and have another bathe? He shook his head. I've got a lot to do on board before tomorrow. We go to sea this week. Can I come and see your submarine? I'd be glad to show it to you. On a quiet day when I can show you everything. And then maybe we could go and have dinner someplace. I'll try to fit it in before the uh, Port Moresby cruise. If you'll give me your telephone number, I'll call you Friday and let you know. Beric 8641. Before ten o'clock is the best time to ring. When Dwight returned to his office in the Sydney, the officer of the deck brought him a sheaf of signals. Mostly they dealt with routine matters, but one from the third naval member's office was unexpected. It told him that a Mr. J.S. Osborne of the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Operations had been ordered to report to Scorpion for scientific duties. This officer would be under the command of the Australian liaison officer. He sent the duty officer to ask Mr. Osborne to come to the office. When he arrived, he said, Well, Mr. Osborne, this is quite a surprise. I'm afraid it was uh, rather a quick decision. I only heard about it the day before yesterday. That's uh, very often the way it is in service matters. The captain glanced at the young scientist, noting the lean, bespectacled, intelligent face, the loose, ungainly figure. Tell me, uh, what are you supposed to be doing in this outfit? I'm to make observations and keep records of the radioactive levels, atmospheric and marine, with special reference to the subsurface levels and radioactivity intensity within the hull. I understand you're uh, making a cruise northwards. Are you anticipating a rise in the radioactive level inside the hull? Well, I don't think so. I doubt if it could happen when you're submerged, except under very extreme conditions, but it's just as well to keep an eye on it. Monday was a turmoil of activity, and on Tuesday, Dwight cast off and set course at slow speed down the bay towards the heads. After cruising around the Cape Banks, Kangaroo Island, and looking at the town of Adelaide through the periscope, the submarine set course for home again. It berthed alongside the aircraft carrier on Friday in time for breakfast, with nothing but minor defects to be rectified. That evening, Dwight rang Moira, as he had promised. Well, we got back in one piece, and there's very little being done on board, so I'd be glad to show it to you. We shan't be going off again before Monday. Tomorrow would be best. I'd love to see her. Do I come to Williamstown Station? Well, that's the best way. What train will you be coming on? Let's say the first one after 11.30. Okay. If I should be tied up, I'll get Peter Holmes or John Osborne to meet you. Did you say John Osborne? An Australian with the CSIRO. Mm, that's the one. A tall guy with spectacles. Why? He's sort of a relation. Is he in your party? Yeah, he's um, joined us as scientific officer. He met her at the station the next morning. She came in an all-white outfit. She was pleasant to look at, but how in hell, he wondered... Was he to get her through the cramped maze of greasy machinery that was Scorpion with her clothes unsullied? Morning, Dwight. Have you been waiting long? Just a few minutes. Did you have to start early? Early enough. You'll give me a drink before lunch, won't you? He hesitated. Uncle Sam doesn't like it aboard ship, but uh, there's a hotel on the corner. We'll go there. He managed to detach her from the hotel after her second double brandy and took her to the Sydney, hoping that she would behave herself in front of his officers. But he need have had no fears. She was demure and courteous, and when he offered her a drink, she chose an orange aid. While she was occupied, the captain drew his liaison officer to one side. Say, um, he observed in a low tone, she can't go down to Scorpion in those clothes. Can you rustle up an overall for her? Peter nodded. I'll draw a boiler suit. She'd better change in your sleeping cabin. She wouldn't be disturbed there. 
They lunched at the end of one of the long tables and took coffee in the anteroom. When the junior officers dispersed to go about their business, Peter laid a boiler suit upon the table. Dwight cleared his throat. I was thinking um, maybe you should go down in an overall, Miss Davidson. I'm afraid you might get that dress pretty dirty down, Scorpion. You could change in my sleeping cabin. You wouldn't be disturbed there. In the little sleeping cabin, she looked about her curiously. There were photographs there, four of them. All showed a dark-haired young woman with two children, a boy eight or nine years old, and a girl a couple of years younger. They looked nice people. She changed and rejoined her host, and he took her down the gangplank to the narrow deck of the submarine, up onto the bridge, and began explaining his ship to her. At the end, he gave her a cup of tea in his day cabin. Sipping it, she asked him, Have you got your orders yet? He nodded. Cairns, Port Moresby, and Darwin. Then we come back here. There isn't anybody left alive in any of those places, is there? I wouldn't know. That's, uh... What we've got to find out. Would you go ashore? I don't think so. It all depends upon the radiation levels. That's why we're taking John Osborne along with us. So we'll have somebody who really uh, understands what the risks are. But if you can't go out and deck, how can you know if there's anyone still living in those places? We get as close and sure as we can manage and call through the loud hailer. Has anybody been into the radioactive area since the war? He nodded. The swordfish, that's our sister ship, made a cruise up in the North Atlantic. She got back to Rio de Janeiro about a month ago. I'm waiting for a copy of her captain's report. How far did she get? She got all over, I believe. She did the eastern states from Florida to Maine and went right into the New York Harbor, right on up the Hudson till she tangled with the wreck of the George Washington Bridge. She went to New London, to Halifax, and to St. John's. Then she crossed the Atlantic and went up the English Channel and into the Thames, but she couldn't get far up that. Then she took a look at Brest and at Lisbon, and by that time she was running out of stores and her crew were in pretty bad shape. So she went back to Rio. Did you find anyone alive? I don't think so. We'd certainly have heard about it if she did. Can you visualize it, Dwight? All those cities, all those fields and farms with, with nobody, with nothing left alive, just nothing there. I simply can't take it in. I can't either. They're all alive to me, those places in the States, just like they were. I'd like them to stay that way till next September. They returned to the Sydney, and she walked with him to the cabin to change out of the boiler suit. She was urgent to get away from the riveted steel walls to the world of make-believe and double brandies where she belonged. When she returned to the wardroom, Dwight left her with John Osborne while he went to change into civilian clothes. They went up to the flight deck where the sun was warm, the sea blue, and the wind fresh. Thank God I'm out of that, she said. I take it you uh, aren't enamored of the Navy. Well, are you having fun? He considered the matter. Yes, I think I am. I, it's going to be rather interesting. Looking at dead people through a periscope. I can think of funnier sorts of fun. Well, it's all knowledge. One has to try and find out what has happened. It could be that it's all quite different from what we think. The radioactive elements may be getting absorbed by something. Something may have happened to the half-life that we don't know about. Even if we don't discover anything that's good, it's still discovering things. I don't think we shall discover anything that's good or very hopeful, but even so, it's fun just finding out. You've got a pretty queer idea of fun. Your trouble is you won't face up to things. All this has happened and is happening, but you won't accept it. You've got to face the facts of life someday. Dwight took her to a restaurant where he was known to the head waiter as the captain of the American submarine. They were well received and given a good table in a corner away from the band. They ordered drinks and dinner. They're pretty nice people here, Dwight said appreciatively. I don't come so often. I don't spend much when I do come. I come here pretty frequently. She sat in reflection for a moment. You know, 
You're a very lucky man. Why do you say that? You've got a full-time job to do. Well, that's so, he said slowly. I certainly don't seem to get a lot of time to go kicking around on the loose. Don't you work at anything? No job at all? Nothing at all. Sometimes I drive a bullock around the farm at home, harrowing the muck. That's all I ever do. When I finished at the university, I was going to do a course of shorthand and typing. But what's the sense in working for a year at that? I wouldn't have time to finish it. And if I did, there aren't any jobs. You mean business is slowing down? She nodded. Lots of my friends are out of a job now. Awful lot of offices are closed. But you could still take that course. It would give you something to work at, just as an alternative to all the double brandies. Work just for the sake of working. It sounds simply foul. Better than just drinking for the sake of drinking. It doesn't give you a hangover. She said irritably, Order me a double brandy, Dwight, and then let's see if you can dance. He took her out upon the dance floor, feeling vaguely sorry for her. She was in a prickly kind of mood. Immersed in his own troubles and occupations, it had never occurred to him that young, unmarried people had their own frustrations in these times. He set himself to make the evening pleasant for her. At ten o'clock on Monday morning, Dwight and Peter were with the first naval member, Sir David Hartman. He lifted a bulky typescript from his desk and handed it to Dwight. This is the report of the commanding officer of USS Swordfish on his cruise from Rio de Janeiro up into the North Atlantic. Dwight turned it over with interest. It's going to be very valuable to us, sir. Is there anything in it to affect this operation? I don't think there is. He found a high level of atmospheric radioactivity over the whole area, greater in the north than in the south, as you'd expect. Take it with you and study it. If you'd want to get in touch with him, he's at Montevideo now. Things are getting hot in Rio. Nine days later, USS Scorpion surfaced at dawn. They'd been submerged for over a week. On the bridge, the captain said to his liaison officer, This report's going to be just a little difficult to write. Indeed, the report was not going to be easy, for they had seen and learned very little in the course of their cruise. They'd approached cairns upon the surface, but within the hull, the radiation level being too great to allow exposure on the bridge. The town had looked absolutely normal to them. It stood bathed in sunshine, with the mountain range of the Atherton Tableland behind. Through the periscope they could see streets of shops, shaded with palm trees, a hospital, and trim villas of one story raised on posts above the ground. There were cars parked on the streets, and one or two flags flying. They went on up the river to the docks. All they could see was a silent waterfront, exactly as it would have looked upon a Sunday or a holiday, though then there would have been activity among the smaller craft. A large black dog appeared and barked at them from a wharf. They had stayed in the river, off the wharves, for a couple of hours, hailing through the loud hailer at its maximum volume. Nothing happened, for the whole town was asleep. Port Moresby had been the same. From the sea they could see nothing of the matter with the town, viewed through the periscope. A merchant ship, registered in Liverpool, lay at anchor in the roads. Two more ships lay on the beach, probably having dragged their anchors in some storm. They stayed there for some hours, calling through the loud hailer, there was no response. Two days later, they reached Port Darwin and lay in the harbour, beneath the town. Here they could see nothing but the wharf, the roof of Government House, and a bit of the Darwin Hotel. Fishing boats laid anchor, and they cruised around these, hailing and examining them through the periscope. They learned nothing, save for the inference that when the end had come, the people had died tidily. It's what animals do, John Osborne said. Creep away into holes to die. they probably all in bed. Swordfish saw practically nothing in the States or in Europe. They couldn't look on shore either. Nobody will ever really know what a hot place looks like. And that goes to the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. John said, I was thinking about that last night. Do you ever strike you that nobody will ever, ever see Cairns again? Or Port Moresby or Darwin? No one else can go up there, not in the time. Peter stirred uneasily. Is anybody writing any kind of history about these times? Not as a history. The information that we've got is all available, of course, but not as a coherent story. 
I think there'd be too many gaps for things we just don't know, such as how many nuclear bombs were dropped and how many were big ones. Fusion bombs, hydrogen bombs, or whatever you call them. Probably most of them. All the bombs in the Russo-Chinese war were hydrogen bombs, I think. Most of them with a cobalt element. The American said, I attended a commanding officer's course in San Francisco the month before the war. They told us what they thought might happen between Russia and China. They said it was all tied up with the warm water ports. Russia hasn't got a port that doesn't freeze up except Odessa, and that's on the Black Sea. To get out of Odessa onto the high seas, the traffic has to pass through two narrow straits, both commanded by NATO in time of war, the Bosphorus and uh, Gibraltar. Murmansk and Vladivostok can be kept open by icebreakers in the winter, but they're a mighty long way from any place in Russia that makes things to export. This guy from intelligence said that uh, what Russia really wanted was Shanghai. He also told us that uh, China had three times the population of Russia, all desperately overcrowded in their country. Russia, next door to the north of them, had millions and millions of square miles of land she didn't use because she didn't have the people to populate it. This guy said that uh, as the Chinese industries increased over the last 20 years, Russia got to be afraid of an attack by China. What do the Chinese think about all this? John asked. Oh, they had another angle altogether. They didn't especially want to kill Russians. They wanted to turn the Russians back into an agricultural people that wouldn't want Shanghai or any other port. They planned a limited fallout of heavy particles not going very far around the world. With no Russian industry left and as radiation eased, the Chinese could have walked in any time they liked and occupied the safe parts of the country that they fancied. You think that's what fled up finally, Peter said after a pause? I mean, after the original attacks the Russians made on Washington and London. John and the captain stared at them. The Russians never bombed Washington, Dwight said. They proved that in the end. I mean, the very first attack of all. Well, that's right, the very first attack. They were Russian long-range bombers, but they were Egyptian manned. They only found out they were Egyptian manned after we'd bombed Leningrad and Odessa and the nuclear establishments at Kharkov, Kubishev, and Molotov. Things must have happened kind of quick that day. Do you mean to say we bombed Russia by mistake? John said, it's never been admitted publicly, but it's quite true. The first one was the bomb on Naples, that was the Albanians, of course. And then there was the bomb on Tel Aviv, nobody knows who dropped that one. Then the British and the Americans intervened and made that demonstration flight over Cairo. Next day, the Egyptians sent out all the serviceable bombers that they'd got, six to Washington and seven to London. One got through to Washington and two to London. After that, there weren't many American or British statesmen left alive. Dwight nodded. The bombers were Russian, and I've heard it said that they had Russian markings. Good God. So we bombed Russia. That's what happened. It's quite understandable, John said. London and Washington were, were out, right out. Decisions had to be made by the military commanders at dispersal in the field. And they had to be made quick before another lot of bombs arrived. Things were very strained with Russia after the Albanian bomb, and these aircraft were identified as Russian. Somebody had to make a decision, and make it in a matter of minutes. Up at Canberra, they think now that uh, he made it wrong. But if it was a mistake, why didn't they get together and stop it? Why did they go on? The captain said, It's mighty difficult to stop a war when when all the statesmen have been killed. The trouble is, John said, the damn things got too cheap. Every little pipsqueak country could have a stockpile of them, and every little country that had thought it could defeat the major countries in a surprise attack. When did China come in? Peter asked. I'd say that probably China came in right there with her rockets and her radiological warfare against Russia taking advantage of the opportunity. But it's all surmise. Most of the communications went up pretty soon. All we know is that uh, the command came down to quite junior officers in most countries. I don't know what I would have done in their shoes. I'm glad I wasn't. The scientist said, I should think you'd have tried to negotiate. With the enemy knocking hell out of the United States and killing all our people when I still had weapons in my hands, just 
stop fighting and give in. I was, I was never trained for diplomacy. If that situation had devolved on me, I, I wouldn't have known how to handle it. Well, they didn't either. It's just too bad. But don't go blaming the Russians. It wasn't the big countries that set off this thing. It was the little ones, the irresponsibles. Two days later, they berthed alongside the aircraft carrier. The first naval member was there to meet them, and he was piped aboard Scorpion. Well, Captain, what sort of crews did you have? We had no trouble, sir. The operation went through in accordance with the orders. But I'm afraid you may find the results are disappointing. You didn't get much information? We got plenty of radiation data, sir. North of uh, 20 latitude, we couldn't go on deck. The Admiral nodded. Have you any sickness? One case the surgeon says is measles, nothing of a radioactive nature. The Admiral stayed 20 minutes. Finally, he said, Well, get in this report as soon as you can. It's a bit disappointing, but you probably did all that anybody could have done. There is one suggestion that I'd like to put forward. Is that, Captain? The radiation levels aren't very high anywhere along the line. The scientific officer tells me that uh, a man could work safely in an insulating suit. We could put an officer on shore in a dinghy with an oxygen pack on his back in any of those places. I'll suggest it to the Prime Minister and see if he wants information upon any specific point. It's an idea. Peter rang up Mary after lunch. Back again, all in one piece. I'll be home sometime tonight, darling. I don't know when. I've got a report to get off first. There's just one thing. We had a case of measles on board, so I'm in a kind of quarantine. Oh, Pete. What about Jennifer? Can anyone get measles when she's as young as she is? I'll ring up Dr. Halloran. We'll fix up something. It's lovely that you're back. Mary rang the doctor and then Moira Davidson. My dear, they're back. Peter rang me from the ship just now. They've all got measles. Moira laughed. <laughs> it's just the sort of thing they would do. Here they go cruising for a fortnight up in parts where everyone is dead of radiation, and all that they catch is measles. Did they find anyone alive up there? I don't know. Peter didn't say anything about it. But that's not important. What am I going to do about Jennifer? Dr. Halloran says... She can catch it, and Peter will be contagious for three weeks. Well, Jennifer could sleep and have her meals out on the veranda. You could put a mosquito net over the pram. I haven't got a mosquito net. I think we've got one somewhere. When Peter arrived home, he found Mary to be somewhat uninterested in cans, but very much concerned about the baby. Moira had rung up to say that she was sending a mosquito net, but in the meantime, Mary had draped a length of butter muslin around the pram. Peter, are you sure she'll get enough air through that, she said anxiously. He tried to reassure her, but three times in the night she left his side to make sure that the baby was still alive. Peter had to go up to town the next day for a meeting at the Navy Department. It ended about noon, and John said, Come along to the pastoral club for lunch. Peter opened his eyes. This was somewhat upstage and rather expensive. Are you a member there? John nodded. I always intended to be one before I died. It was now or never. In the club's garden they found a number of members, mostly past middle age, discussing the affairs of the day. An elderly gentleman waved to them from a group upon the lawn and started towards them. John said quietly, It's my uh, great-uncle, Douglas Froude, Lieutenant General, you know. He nodded. Sir Douglas Froude had commanded the army before Peter was born. He was still erect in figure, though white-haired and red of face. He greeted his great-nephew cheerfully. Ah, John, I heard last night you were back again. Had a good trip? John introduced Peter. Quite good. Um, I don't know that we found out very much. I didn't expect to see you here today. I thought your day was Friday. Oh, no, no. It used to be Friday. Three years ago, my doctor told me if I didn't stop drinking the club board, he couldn't guarantee my life for longer than a year. But everything's changed now, of course. Do you know, we've got over 3,000 bottles of vintage port still left in the cellars, and only about six months left to go, if what the scientists say is right. What are you going to do about it? There's only one thing to do. Drink it, my boy, drink it. Every drop. No good leaving it for the next comer with the cobalt half-life over five years. 
I come in now three days a week. If I'm to die, as I most certainly am, I'd rather die of drinking port than of this cholera thing. The old man turned to Peter. I really like serving in an American ship. I like it very much, sir. It's a bit different from our Navy, of course, but I've never served in a submarine before. The captain, is he, um, is he a commander Tars? That's right, sir. Do you know him? He's been in here once or twice, and I've been introduced to him. Bill Davidson was telling me that Moira knows him. She does, sir. They met at my house. Well, I hope she doesn't get him into mischief. At that moment, she was ringing up the commander in the aircraft carrier, doing her best to do so. This is Moira, she said. Are you going down to Peter Holmes this weekend? He hasn't asked me. Would you go if you were asked? I'll be glad to. Can I speak to Peter? Not here he can't. He's lunching with John Osborne at the pastoral club. She rang off and caught Peter as he was about to leave. Peter, will you ask Dwight down to your place for the weekend? I'll ask myself. Well, if you like. I don't suppose you come. He will. She met Dwight at Falmer Station in her buggy. Peter and Mary had arranged a beach picnic supper for the evening's entertainment. In Mary's somewhat muddled view, the more the men were kept out of the house, the less likely they were to give the baby measles. That afternoon, Moira and Dwight went to the club to sail in a race. Peter and Mary followed later with the baby. After the race, they bathed in leisurely fashion and then walked out to the jetty's end to see the sunset, while Peter and Mary got busy with the supper. Sitting with him perched upon a rail, watching the rosy lights reflected in the calm sea, Moira said, Dwight, tell me about the cruise that the swordfish made. Did you say she went to the United States? That's right, she went everywhere she could along the eastern seaboard, but all it amounted to was a few of the small ports and harbors, Delaware Bay, the Hudson River, and, of course, uh, New London. New London, where's that? In Connecticut, it's the main U.S. Navy submarine base on the East Coast. Most of the crew lived there, or in the general area, like I did. You lived there? Not in New London itself. The base is on the other side of the river, the east side. I've got a home about 50 miles up the coast from the river entrance. A little place called West Mystic. When you let me use your cabin to change in, I saw the photographs. Are those your family? That's my wife and our two kids, Sharon. Dwight goes to grade school, and Helen, she'll be going next fall. She goes to a little kindergarten right now, just up the street. She had known for some time that his wife and family were more real to him than the half-life in a far corner of the world that had been forced upon him since the war. The devastation of the Northern Hemisphere was not real to him as it was not real to her. She wanted to be kind to him, and she had to say something. She asked a little timidly, What's Dwight going to be when he grows up? I'd like him to go to the Naval Academy and go into the Navy like I did. It's a good life for a boy. I don't know any better. Whether he can make the grade or not, well, that's another thing. His mathematics aren't so hot, but uh, it's too early yet to say. He won't be ten till next July. Have you started him sailing yet? No, not yet. I'm going to get a sailboat when I'm home next on leave. I guess that'll be next September. He got up and stood for a moment, looking at the sunset glow. I suppose you think I'm nuts, but that's the way I see it. I don't think you're nuts. They walked together in silence to the beach. At breakfast next morning, Sunday... Mary asked her guest if he wanted to go to church. I'd like to, if that's convenient. Just do whatever you like. I thought we might take tea down to the club this afternoon. I could use another swim, but I'll have to get back to the ship sometime tonight, after supper, maybe. Can I come to church with you? Moira asked. He looked at her in surprise. Why, certainly. Do you go regularly? Not once in a blue moon. Might be better if I did. Maybe I wouldn't drink so much. When they'd set off, Mary said somewhat anxiously, I hope it's going to be all right. Peter said, Well, why shouldn't it be, Stinkum? She's not a bad sort when you get to know her. We might even get married. It's no concern of ours, anyway. 
Peter and Mary spent the morning happily planning their garden for the next ten years. When Moira and Dwight came back, they were called into consultation on the layout of the kitchen garden. Then Peter and Mary went into the house to get drinks and lunch, and the girl glanced at her companion. Someone's crazy. Is it me or them? Why do you say that? They won't be here in six months' time. I won't be here. You won't be here. They won't want any vegetables next year. So what? Thing is, they just kind of like to plan a garden. Don't go and spoil it for them, telling them they're crazy. I wouldn't do that. She stood in silence for a minute. None of us really believe it's ever going to happen. Not to us. Everybody's crazy on that point, one way or another. That afternoon, they strolled down to the beach. Moira and Dwight bathed, leaving Peter sunning himself on the sand. Presently, they rejoined Peter, and Dwight started to put on his socks. Moira exclaimed, Fancy going around in socks like that. He glanced at them. Oh, it's only the toe. It doesn't show. If you give them to me, I'll mend them for you. Oh, that's mighty nice of you, but it's time I got more. These are just about done. Can you get more socks? Daddy can't. He says they're going off the market with a lot of other things. Peter said, That's right. I couldn't get socks to fit me the last time I tried. He yawned. Better let him mend them for you, sir. If that's the way it is, I'd be very grateful. Let me have everything that needs mending, and I'll see if I can't get you dressed up like a naval officer. Okay. Where shall I bring the stuff? She thought for a moment. You're on leave, aren't you? You'd better bring them down to me at, uh, at Berwick and stay a couple of nights. Can you drive a bullock? Well, I've never driven one, but I could try. She eyed him speculatively. I suppose it would be all right. If you can command a submarine, you probably can't do much harm to one of our bullocks. What am I supposed to do with the bullock? Spare the dung, the car pads. Makes good pasture. Daddy is very particular about harrowing each pasture after the beasts come out. We used to do it with a tractor. Now we do it with a bullock. This is all so he gets uh, a better pasture next year. Yes, it is, she said firmly. All right, you needn't say it. Good farming to harrow the paddocks, and Daddy's a good farmer. I'd like to come and spend a day or two. I expect I can make myself useful one way or another. When she returned home, she told her parents she had asked Dwight Towers down for a couple of days. He's coming on Tuesday. I told him he could drive the bullock round the paddocks. It's very practical. Well, I could do with some help, her father said. Her mother was properly impressed. Later, she said, I do hope something comes of it. I would like to see her settle down and happily married with children. Well, she'll have to be quick about it if you're going to see that. On Tuesday afternoon... Moira met Dwight. He was carrying a suitcase and swung it up into the buggy, pushing it under the seat. Is that all you got? she demanded. That's right, it's full of manting. Doesn't look much. I brought everything there was, honest. They got up and started off towards the village. Gradually they entered a country of gracious farms on undulating hilly slopes, a place where well-kept paddocks were interspersed with coppices and many trees. Dwight said, You're mighty lucky to have a home in country like this. I don't know that I ever saw a place that was more beautiful. Is it as beautiful as places in America or England? Why, sure. I don't know England so well. I'm told that parts of that are just a fairyland. There's plenty of lovely scenery in the United States, but I don't know of any place that's just like this. I'm glad to hear you say that. I mean, I like it here, but then... I've never seen anything else. One sort of thinks that everything in England or America must be better. He shook his head. It's not like that at all. This is good by any standard. Moira turned into the entrance gate. A short drive led between an avenue of pine trees to a single-story, fairly large wooden house, painted white, that merged with farm buildings towards the back. A wide veranda ran along the front and down one side, partially glazed in. Her parents came out to greet them, and presently Moira left Dwight on the veranda with her father. 
As they sat in the mellow evening sun over their drinks, the grazier said, Moira was telling us about the cruise that you just made up to the north. It was very radioactive, was it? Dwight nodded. It gets worse the further you go north, of course. Finally, it'll get to the same level all around the world. They're still saying it's uh, going to get here in September. I would say that's right. It's coming very evenly along the latitudes. If it goes on the way it's going now, Cape Town will go out a little before Sydney, about the same time as Montevideo. There'll be nothing left then in Africa and South America. Melbourne is the most southerly major city in the world, so we'll be near the last, he paused and thought. New Zealand, most of it may last a little longer, and of course, Tasmania, a fortnight or three weeks perhaps. I don't know if there's anybody in Antarctica, if so, they might go on for quite a while. They sat in silence for a time. One of the things that's been surprising me, the grazier said, is that there have been so few refugees, so few people coming down from the north, from Cairns and Townsville and places like that. Oh, well, there's not much comfort in leaving home and coming down here to live in a tent or in a car and have the same thing happen to you in a month or two. You know, um, now that I've got used to the idea, I think I'd rather have it this way. We've all got to die sooner or later. I kind of like the thought that... Um, I'll be fit and well up until the end of August, and then, and then home. I'd rather have it that way than go on as a sick man from when I'm seventy to when I'm ninety. There followed a very restful two days for Dwight. He handed over a great bundle of mending, and the two women busied themselves over it. He was occupied upon the farm from dawn to dusk, and spent long hours walking by the bullock on the sunlit pastures. The change did him good after the confined life in the submarine. Each night he went to bed early, slept heavily, and awoke refreshed for the next day. On his last morning he was given his newly mended clothes, and Moira drove him to the station after lunch. When he got back to the aircraft carrier, he found a sealed envelope containing a draft operation order. He rang Peter. Say, I've got a draft operation order with a covering letter from the first naval member. I hate to pull you back off leave, but this needs action. By half past nine next morning, Peter was seated with Dwight, reading through the order. It's more or less what you thought it was going to be, isn't it, sir? They made an appointment to see the first naval member at ten o'clock the following morning, and Peter took the next train home. He found Mary to be very much concerned about the baby's prowess in crawling. I have to get some kind of playpen, he said, one of those wooden things that fold up. It was not until lunch was nearly over that she was able to detach her mind from the baby. Then she asked, Oh, Peter, what happened with Commander Towers? He'd got a draft operation order. I suppose it's confidential, so don't talk about it. They want us to make a fairly long cruise in the Pacific, Panama, San Diego, San Francisco, and home, perhaps by way of Hawaii. It's all a bit vague, just at present. How long would it take? I haven't worked it out exactly, probably about two months. When would you be starting? I don't know. We should be clear of measles by the 10th of March. That means we'd be back here by early June. Peter met his captain next morning in the Navy Department and they were shown into the office of the first naval member who greeted them cordially. Well, now, he said, you've had a look at the draft operation order that we sent you. What's your general reaction? Oh, minefields. Some of the objectives that you name would almost certainly be mined, the Admiral nodded. We have full information on Pearl Harbor, and on the approaches to Seattle, we have nothing on any of the others. Well, you'd better know what all this is about. There's a school of thought among some scientists that this atmospheric radioactivity may be dissipating, decreasing intensity fairly quickly. The general argument is that the precipitation during this last winter in the northern hemisphere, the rain and the snow, may have washed the air, so to speak. Now, according to this theory, the radioactive elements in the atmosphere will be falling to the ground or to the sea more quickly than we had anticipated. 
Now, in that case, the ground masses of the northern hemisphere would continue to be uninhabitable for many centuries, but the transfer of radioactivity to us would be progressively decreased, and life, human life, might continue to go on down here, or at any rate in Antarctica. Professor Jorgensen holds this view very strongly, and most of the scientists disagree and think he is optimistic, but clearly it's a matter that must be investigated. I see that, sir. That's really the main object of this cruise. The Admiral nodded. That's why we want you to go as far north in the Pacific as you can, to Kodiak and to Dutch Harbor. If you're right, there should be much less radioactivity up there. It might even be near normal. In that case, you might be able to go out on deck. I'm sure, of course, ground radioactivity would still be intense, but out at sea, life might be possible. Peter asked, Is there any experimental support for this yet, sir? The Admiral shook his head. They discussed the technicalities of the operation for a time. Finally, the Admiral said, I think the next step is that I call a conference with CSIRO and anybody else who may be concerned. I'll arrange that for next week. I'd like you to get away by the end of next month. When they left the office, Peter went off to find John and tell him what he had learned that morning. I know all about Jorgensen, John said impatiently. The old man's crackers. The Jorgensen effect may well exist, probably it does. But nobody but Jorgensen thinks that it's significant. I'll leave the wise to wrangle, Peter said sardonically. I've got to go and buy a playpen for my eldest unmarried daughter. I'll come with you. I've got something in Elizabeth Street I'd like to show you. They walked to a mews in the motorcar district of the town, and John unlocked the double doors of a garage. In the middle of the floor stood a racing car. It was a single-seater, very low-built, very small car, painted red, with the bonnet sloping forward to an aperture that lay close to the ground. It looked venomously fast. My goodness, Peter said. What's that? It's a Ferrari. It's the one that Donizetti raced the year before the war. The one he won the Grand Prix of Syracuse in. Who owns it now? I do. Been keen on motor racing all my life. What I've always wanted to do, but there's never been any money. Then I heard of this Ferrari. The then owner was caught in England, and I was able to buy it for a hundred quid. What on earth are you going to do with it? Oh, I don't know yet. I only know that I'm the owner of what's probably the fastest car in the world. As they left the mews, Peter said, If we get away on this cruise by the end of next month, we should be back about the beginning of June. I'm thinking about Mary and the kid. I think they'll be all right till we get back. You mean the radioactivity? Peter nodded. The scientist stood and thought. Anybody's guess is as good as mine, he said at last. So far, it's been coming very steadily all around the world and moving southwards at just about the rate that you'd expect. If it goes on like this, it should be south of Brisbane by the beginning of June, say, about 800 miles north of us. But it may come quicker, may come slower. That's all I can tell you. Peter bit his lip. It's a bit worrying. One doesn't want to start a flap at home, but I'd be happier if Mary knew what to do if I'm not there. They turned to different directions, and the scientist walked on. Thankful that he wasn't married. Peter went shopping for a playpen, and then went to the chemist whose proprietor, Mr. Goldie, knew him. Could I have a word with you in private? Why, yes, Commander. He led the way into the dispensary. I wanted to have a talk with you about this radiation disease. I've got to go away. I'm sailing in Scorpion, in the American submarine. We shan't be back till the beginning of June at the earliest. It's not a very easy trip, and there's just the possibility that we might not come back at all. I'll have to make sure Mrs. Holmes understands about things before I go. Paused. Tell me, just what does happen to you? Well, um, nausea is the first symptom, then vomiting and diarrhea, bloody stools. All the symptoms increase in intensity. There may be a slight recovery, but if so, it would be very temporary. Finally, death occurs from sheer exhaustion. Somebody was saying it's like cholera. Oh, that's right. It's, it is rather like cholera. You've got some stuff for it, haven't you? Well, not to cure, I'm afraid. 
No, I don't mean that, to end it. Well, we can't release that yet, Commander. About a week before it reaches any district, details will be given out in the wireless. After that, we may distribute it to those who ask for it. I could explain it all to Mrs. Holmes if you're not back when the time comes. Well, I'd rather do it myself. She'll be a bit upset. Now, of course. The chemist stood for a moment in thought, and then took him into a back room, which had a packing case in one corner, full of little red boxes of two sizes. He took out one of each, and undid the smaller of the two. It contained a little plastic vial with two white tablets in it. He removed these carefully, and substituted two tablets of aspirin, and handed the box to Peter. You can take that one and show it to Mrs. Holmes. One pill causes death almost immediately. The other is a spare. What does one do about the baby? Oh, the baby, or a pet animal, a dog or a cat, is just a little more complicated. The chemist opened the second box and took out a small syringe. I've got a used one I can put in for you. You follow the instructions on the box, just give the injection under the skin. She'll fall asleep quite soon. My wife will be able to get these at the counter when the time comes. That's right. Will there be anything to pay? No charge. They're on the free list. Of the three presents which Peter took back to his wife that night, the playpen was the most appreciated. She put her arms around him and kissed him. It's lovely. Thank you so much. When Mary took the baby away to make her ready for bed, Peter got himself a whiskey, wondering how on earth he was to give her his other presents. He did it that evening, shortly before they went to bed. He said awkwardly, There's one thing I want to have a talk about before I go off on this cruise. What's that? It's about this radiation sickness people get. It's one or two things that you ought to know. Oh, that. It's not till September. I don't want to talk about it. I'm afraid we'll have to. We're all going to get it. We're all going to die of it. That's why I want to tell you just a bit about it now. You see, I might not be here when it happens. It might come quicker than we think while I'm away. All right, she said reluctantly. Go on and tell me. We've all got to die one day. I don't know that dying this way is much worse than any other. What happens is that you get ill. You start feeling sick, and then you are sick. Apparently, you go on being sick. You can't keep anything down, and then diarrhea, and that gets worse and worse, too. And, and finally, you get so weak that you just die. Peter and Mary looked at each other in silence. It's messy, she said at last. But you'll be here, Peter. I'll be here, he comforted her. I'm just telling you to cover the thousand to one chance. The thing is, you don't have to die in a mess. You can die decently when things begin to get too bad. He drew the smaller of the two red boxes from his pocket undid the little carton and took out the vial. This is a dummy. These aren't real. Goldie gave it to me to show you what to do. You just take one of them with a drink, any kind of drink, and then you just lie back and that's the end. When the time comes, they'll tell you all about this on the wireless. Then, then you just go to Goldie's and, and ask for it. Everybody will be given it who wants it. She reached out, took the box from him, and read the printed instructions. At last she said, Peter, however ill I was, I couldn't do that. Who would look after Jennifer? We're all going to get it. Every living thing. Dogs and cats and babies, everyone. Jennifer's going to get it too. Jennifer's going to get this sort of cholera? I'm afraid so, dear. Things are hopeless. You can make it easy for her. It's going to take a bit of courage on your part, but you've got that. This is what you'll have to do. He began to explain the process to her. She watched him with growing hostility. Let me get this straight, she said with an edge to her voice. Are you trying to tell me what I've got to do is to kill Jennifer? He knew there was trouble coming, but he had to face it. That's right. 
If it becomes necessary, you'll have to do it. He'd never seen her so angry before. She said furiously, There's a trick here somewhere. You're trying to get me to murder Jennifer and kill myself. Then you'd be free to go off with some other woman. Don't be a bloody fool, he said sharply. If I'm here, I'll have it myself. If I'm not here, I'll be dead. She stared at him in angry silence. There's another thing you'd better think about. Jennifer may live longer than you will. She may live on for days, crying and vomiting all over herself in a cot and lying in her muck with you dead on the floor beside her. Do you want her to die like that? This is a time when you've got to face up to things. She turned and ran out of the room to their bedroom. When he finally went to bed, the light was out. Later he awoke to hear her sobbing and stretched out a hand to comfort her. She turned to him. Oh, Peter, I'm sorry I've been such a fool. They said no more about the red boxes. But the next morning he put them in the medicine cupboard in the bathroom at the back, where they would not be obtrusive, but where she could hardly fail to see them. The pleasant summer weather lasted well on into March. Work on Scorpion progressed quickly. John started up his Ferrari and drove it out to a road racing circuit, owned and run by a club of enthusiasts. Here there was three miles of wide bitumen road leading nowhere and closed to the public. Each little race or practice run left him with the realization of mistakes that he must never make again and of death escaped by inches. Sir David Hartman held his conference as had been arranged. It was attended by Dwight as captain of Scorpion, his liaison officer, the radio and electrical officer, Lieutenant Sunderstrom, John Osborne, and the director of CSIRO, and one of the Prime Minister's secretaries. The first naval member outlined the difficulties of the operation. It is my desire, he said, and the Prime Minister's instruction that Scorpion should not be exposed to any extreme danger in the course of this cruise. She must return safely, or the results of her scientific observations will be lost. Apart from that, she's the only long-range vessel left at our disposal for communication with South America and South Africa. With these considerations in mind, I've made fairly drastic alterations to the cruise that we discussed at our last meeting. Investigations of the Panama Canal, San Diego, and San Francisco have been struck out on account of minefields. Commander Towers, you tell us how you stand in regard to minefields. Well, uh, Seattle is open to us, and the whole of Puget Sound, also Pearl Harbor. I'd say there wouldn't be much danger from mines up around the Gulf of Alaska, but ice constitutes a problem in those latitudes. Still, I'd say we can probably do most of what you want. They turned to a discussion of the radio signals still coming from somewhere in the vicinity of Seattle, using a frequency of 4.92 megacycles. So David asked, How many hours transmission and all were monitored? About 106. And in that time only two words have come through clear? The rest is gibberish? That's correct. The Admiral said, I don't think the words can be significant. It's probably a fortuitous transmission. Lieutenant Sunderstrom said, I attended a short course at Santa Maria Island in Puget Sound. It's the main Navy communication school for that area. One of the frequencies that was used there was 4.92 megacycles. Dwight said, If it turns out to be Santa Maria, I'd say we can investigate it without difficulty. There's 40 feet of water right up close to it. We've got the rubber boat. And if the radiation level is anywhere near reasonable, we can put an officer on shore for a while. The lieutenant said, I'd be glad to volunteer for that. They left it so, and turned to consideration of the Jorgensen effect and the scientific observations that were needed to prove or disprove it. Dwight met Moira for lunch after the conference. She came bearing an attaché case. He greeted her and glanced at it. Been shopping? Shopping, she said indignantly. Me? Full of virtue. She lifted the lid and showed a reporter's notebook, pencil, and a shorthand manual. He stared. Say, are you taking course or something? Every morning. Have to get up before seven. He grinned. Well, that's bad. What are you doing it for? Something to do. Got fed up with harrying the dung. Be able to get a good job next year. Are many people doing it? There are more than I thought there'd be, and the numbers are going up. Over lunch, she asked. 
When are you starting off on this cruise? In about a week from now. Is it going to be very dangerous? Why, no. What made you think that? Well, I spoke to Mary Holmes over the telephone yesterday. She seemed a bit worried about something Peter told her about this cruise. Not directly, at least I don't think so. More like making his will or something. Well, that's always a good thing to do. Everybody ought to make a will. Every married man, that is. After lunch, they strolled around the National Gallery, chatting and looking at the pictures. Then she had to go. They arranged to meet for dinner the following Tuesday. There was still an hour left before the shop shut, and Dwight walked along the pavement, looking at the shop windows. Presently, he came to a sports shop, hesitated, and then went in. In the fishing department, he said to the assistant, I want a spinning outfit, a rod, a reel, and a nylon line. Certainly, sir. For yourself? He shook his head. Now, this is a present for a boy ten years old. His first rod. I like something good quality, but pretty small and light. The assistant reached down a rod from the rack. This is a very good little rod and steel. How would that stand up in seawater for rusting? He lives by the sea, and you know what kids are. Now, we sell a lot of these for sea fishing. The assistant reached for reels, while Dwight examined the rod and tested it in his hand. When he completed his purchase, he went through into the department that sold children's bicycles and scooters. He said to the girl, Have you got a pogo stick? Pogo stick? No, oh, I don't think so. I'll ask the manager. I'm afraid we're right out, the manager said. Try McPhail's. They might have one left. But McPhail's, too, were out of pogo sticks. Tried another shop with similar results. Pogo sticks, it seemed, were off the market. In the last of the shopping hour, he paused before a jeweler's window, and then went in. I was thinking of a bracelet, he said to the young man at the counter. Emeralds and diamonds, perhaps. The lady's dark, and she likes to wear green. Got anything like that? The man went to the safe, and came back with three bracelets, which he laid on a black velvet pad. Dwight picked one up, and examined it. It was a lovely piece. She had nothing like it in her jewel box. He knew that she would love it. I'll take that, he said. I'll have to pay you with a check. I'll call in and pick it up tomorrow, the next day. As he left, he turned to the man. One thing, you wouldn't happen to know where I could buy a pogo stick, a present for a little girl. It seems they're kind of scarce around here, just a present. I'm afraid I can't, sir. Two days later, a Mrs. Hector Fraser encountered Moira, whom she'd known from a child. She stopped and asked after her mother. Then she said, My dear... You know Commander Towers, don't you? Yes, I know him quite well. He spent a weekend out with us the other day. Do you think he's crazy? Perhaps all Americans are crazy. Well, no crazier than the rest of us these days. What's he been up to? He's been trying to buy a pogo stick in Simmons. Moira was suddenly alert. Pogo stick? My dear, it seems he went to Simmons and bought the most beautiful bracelet and paid some fat bit as price for it. And then he asked where he could buy a pogo stick. He said he wanted it for a present for a little girl. What's wrong with that? Moira turned away. Must get along. It's been nice seeing you. I'd tell Mummy. She walked on down the street, but the matter of the pogo stick stayed in her mind. She went so far as to inquire into the pogo stick market and found it to be depressed. Dwight was going to have some difficulty getting one. When she met him on Tuesday evening, he was pleasant and courteous, but she felt all the time that he was thinking of other things. Presently, she said, You're worried over something, aren't you? No, not really. I'm afraid I've been bad company tonight. Is it about the submarine? I know, honey, I told you there's nothing dangerous in that. It's just another job. It's not about pogo stick, is it? He stared at her in amazement. Say, how did you get to hear about that? She laughed gently. <laughs> I have my spies. What did you get for Junior? Oh, a fishing rod. I suppose you think I'm nuts. She shook her head. I don't. Did you get a pogo stick? No, it seems they're completely out of stock. It was just a crazy idea I had. It's not important. It's important to me. I can get one for you by the time you come back. I know that isn't quite what you want, but would that do? 
I'll have it with me when we meet again. He kissed her gently. That's for the promise, and for everything else. Sharon wouldn't mind me doing this. It's from us both. Twenty-five days later, USS Scorpion was approaching the first objective of her cruise. She'd given Los Angeles a wide berth because of minefields. They had inspected San Francisco from five miles outside the Golden Gate. All they learned was that the bridge was down and that the houses visible from the sea around the Golden Gate Park had suffered much from fire and blast. It did not look as if any of them were habitable. They saw no evidence of human life, and the radiation level made it seem improbable that life could still exist in that vicinity. That night, directly they switched on the direction finder, they heard again the radio transmission from Seattle. This time, they were able to pinpoint it fairly accurately. Dwight bent over the navigation table with Lieutenant Sunderstrom as he plotted the bearing. Santa Maria, looks like you were right. They stood listening to the meaningless jumble coming out of the speaker. It's fortuitous, Lieutenant said at last. That's not someone king. Even someone doesn't know about radio. That's something that's just happening. Sounds like it. Dwight stood listening. There's power there. Hydroelectric. I know it. But hell, those turbines won't run for two years without maintenance. Well, you wouldn't think so, but some of the mighty good machinery, Dwight grunted. We'll go on as we're going now and get a fix around midday. If it looks all right, maybe we'll be able to go right up to Santa Maria. Are you ready to go on shore if we do? Sure. I kind of like to get out of the ship for a while. They submerged again and carried on towards the north all the next day. At midnight, they surfaced, according to their routine, off the mouth of the Columbia River. The officer on duty raised the periscope and swung it around. Then he turned quickly. Say, go and call the captain. Lights on shore, 30 to 40 degrees in the starboard bow. In a minute or two, they were all looking through the periscope in turn. Dwight bent over the chart with his executive officer. What's the outside radiation level, Mr. Osborne? 30 in the red, sir. The captain nodded. Much too high for life to be maintained, but not immediately lethal. There'd been little change in the last four or five days. He went to the periscope and stood there for a long time. Okay, he said at last. Set course for Santa Maria, ten knots. They turned southwest, and Dwight called Lieutenant Sunderstrom to his cabin. You all set to go? he asked. Everything's all ready. I just gotta jump into the suit. Okay. You've got air for two hours in the cylinders. I want you back, decontaminated, and in the hull in an hour and a half. I'll keep the time for you here. I'll sound the siren every quarter of an hour. One blast when you've been gone quarter of an hour, two blasts half an hour, and so on. When you hear four blasts, you start winding up whatever you may be doing. At five blasts, you drop everything and come right back. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I want you back on board safe. The only thing that would justify you taking any risk would be if you find any signs of life on shore. Okay, sir. The submarine nosed her way forward with the hull just awash, feeding her way to Santa Maria at a slow speed. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon when she finally laid to off the island in six fathoms of water. Dwight went forward and found Lieutenant Sunderstrom ready in the radiation suit. Okay, fella. Off you go. The radio officer adjusted the helmet and the harness of the pack, tested the air, glanced at the pressure gauge, elevated one thumb, and climbed into the escape trunk, closing the door behind him. Out on deck, he lowered the rubber boat into the water and pushed off. It took him ten minutes to reach the jetty. He made the boat fast and clambered up the ladder. As he began to walk towards the shore, he heard one blast from the siren. He came to a group of grey-painted buildings, stores of some kind, and a latrine. He paused, then looked in. A body in khaki gabardine lay half in and half out of one of the compartments, much decomposed. The sight was sobering. He left and went on up the road. A transformer station, with a complex of wires and insulators, attracted his attention, and he heard the hum of an electrical machine running. The siren sounded two blasts. He followed the hum to a powerhouse. The converter was running with a faint, grating noise. It would not, he thought, last very much longer. He left the powerhouse and went into the office building, 
and upstairs to the main transmitting room. There were two transmitting desks. One was dead, the instruments all at zero. The other stood by the window, and here the casement had been blown from its hinges and lay across the desk. One end of the frame projected outside the building and teetered gently in the light breeze. The other rested unstably above the transmitting key. He reached out and touched the frame, and the needle on the set flipped upwards. He released it, and the needle fell back. That was one of Scorpion's missions completed, something they had come 10,000 miles to see that had absorbed so much effort and attention in Australia on the other side of the world. He lifted the window frame from the desk and sat down and began transmitting. He sent Santa Maria sending, USS Scorpion reporting, no life here, closing down. He went on repeating this message over and over again, and while he was doing so, the siren blew three blasts. He finished when he judged he had been at it for twenty minutes. The three final repetitions, he added the words, Lieutenant Sunderstrom sending, all well on board, proceeding northwards to Alaska. Finally, he sent, closing down the station now and switching off. He then went back down to the powerhouse and tripped two switches. The machine had done a swell job, and he could not have borne to leave it running till it cracked up. The siren blew four blasts while he was there. His work now was over, but he still had a quarter of an hour. There was everything here to be explored, and nothing to be gained by doing so. He returned upstairs to the transmitting room, where he'd seen a pile of set to evening posts. He leafed through them avidly, as he hoped they contained the three concluding installments of the serial The Lady in the Lumberjack issued after Scorpion had left Pearl Harbor, and he sat down to read. The siren blew five blasts before he was halfway through the first installment. He must go. He hesitated, then rolled up the magazines, tucked them under his arm, and made his way back towards the jetty. Back on deck, he stripped quickly and got down into the escape trunk, turning on the shower. Five minutes later, he was making his report to Dwight. The executive officer and the liaison officer were beside him. We got your signals on the radio here, Captain said. I don't know if they'll get them in Australia. What would you say, Peter? I'd say they'd have got them. It's autumn there, not too many electrical storms. That evening, Mary rang Moira at her home. Darling, there's been a wireless signal from them. They're all well. However, did they get a signal through? Well, it came through on that mystery station that they went to find out about. Lieutenant Sunderstrom was sending. He said they're all well. Isn't it splendid? Can't you come over sometime? It's an age since we met. Um, I could come over one evening after work and go up again the next day. Oh, that would be wonderful. Moira arrived two nights later, and Mary was waiting to welcome her with a bright fire in the lounge. After supper, as they sat on the floor before the fire, Moira asked, When do you think they'll be back? Peter said they'd be back about the 14th of June. Three more weeks, just over. I've been crossing off the days. Peter says this is his last job for the Navy. I was wondering if we couldn't get away in June or July and have a holiday, somewhere where it's warm. Queensland or somewhere. I shouldn't think Queensland would be very easy, said Moira. They've got it at Maryborough, just north of Brisbane. Mary glanced at her. Tell me, do you really think it's going to come here? They're all going to die of it, like the men say. I suppose so. Mary pulled a catalogue of garden flowers, down from a muddle of papers on the settee. I went to Wilson's today, brought a hundred daffodils, bulbs, King Alfred's. But I suppose if we're all going to die, that's silly. Well, no sillier than me starting in to learn shorthand typing. When do daffodils come up? They should be flowering by the end of August. There won't be much this year. They should be lovely next year. Well, of course it's sensible to put them in. You'll see them anyway. You'll sort of feel you've done something. Mary looked at her gratefully. Well, that's what I think. I mean, I couldn't bear to just stop doing things. Might as well die now and get it over. After a short silence, Mary said, Oh, I forgot. Would you like a brandy? There's a bottle in the cupboard, and I think there's some soda. Moira shook her head. No, not for me. I'm quite happy. You reformed or something? Or something. It's 
right towers, isn't it? Yes, it's right. Don't you ever want to get married? I mean, even if we are all dying next September. Moira stared into the fire. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have everything that you've got, but I shan't have it now. Couldn't you marry Dwight? She shook her head. I don't think so. You see, he's married already. He's got a wife and two children in America. Darling, he can't have. They must be dead. He doesn't think so, Moira said warily. You mean he really thinks his wife is still alive? Now, I think he knows he's going to be dead next September, but that he's still going home to them, to Sharon and Dwight Jr. and Helen. He's been buying presents for them. It doesn't make sense. But nothing seems to make sense these days. Peter... She stopped. What about Peter? Oh, I don't know. It was just horrible and crazy. Mary shifted restlessly. It's a frightful sin to murder anybody, isn't it? I mean, you'd go to hell. I don't know. I suppose you would. Who do you want to murder? Mary said dully. Peter told me I might have to murder Jennifer. He showed me how. She burst into a torrent of tears. Moira took her in her arms and soothed her, and gradually the story came out. I couldn't do it alone. However bad she was, I couldn't do it. If Peter isn't here, if anything happens to Scorpion, will you come and help me, Moira, please? Of course I will. Of course I'll come and help, but Peter will be here. They're coming back, all right. Dwight's that kind of a man. Eighteen days later, Scorpion surfaced in clean air near Norfolk Island. They had disproved the Jorgensen effect. They ventured slowly into the Gulf of Alaska, using their underwater mine detector as a defense against floating icebergs. Up there, the radiation level was still lethal, and a little different from what they had experienced in the Seattle district. They set course a little to the east of south till they found warmer water, and then southwest towards Hawaii and Pearl Harbor. At Pearl Harbor, they'd learned practically nothing. They'd cruised right into the harbor and up to the dock that they had sailed from before the outbreak of the war. Dwight could have put an officer on shore, as he had done at Santa Maria, but could think of nothing to be gained by such an expedition. Peter reported to the second naval member the day after they returned to Williamstown. I made Commander Towers for a few minutes last night, the Admiral said. You seem to have got on well with him. You told me, uh, when I last saw you, that you would prefer to be on shore these last months. I should. I've, I've got to think about my wife. Of course. Scorpion's going to dry dock for hull reconditioning. Would you like to stay on with her as liaison officer while that work is going on? I'd like to carry on, sir, subject to living at home. But if the ship is programmed for another cruise, I'd like you to replace me. I don't think I could undertake another seagoing appointment. The Admiral smiled. I'll keep that in mind. Come and see and be relieved. Moira rang Dwight in the aircraft carrier at lunchtime. Morning, Dwight. You're very busy. Or could you come out to Harkaway for a bit? Would tomorrow afternoon be possible? He thought for a moment. I'll have to shovel things around a little, but I think I could. When she met him, she was concerned at his appearance. He greeted her cheerfully and seemed glad to see her, but he'd gone a yellowish color beneath his tan. She frowned at the sight of him. You're looking like something that the cat brought in, didn't want. Are you all right? She took his hand and felt it. You're hot. You've got a temperature. You ought to be in bed. I telephoned Daddy to bring the buggy. A couple of hours later, he was creeping into a warm bed as he shook with a light fever. When the doctor came, he diagnosed flu. There's quite a lot of it about. You'd better not go back to work for at least a week. You really ought to take some leave. He left, and presently Moira came in. She carried a long paper parcel with a bulge at the bottom. She brought it to him and stood watching as he tore off the paper. A pogo stick lay on the bedclothes, shining and new. The wooden handle was brightly varnished, the metal step gleaming in red enamel. On the wooden handle was painted in neat red lettering the words Helen Towers. Say, he said huskily, that's dandy. I never saw one with a name on it and all. She's going to love that. I don't know what to say. Now I've got something for everyone. She moved towards the door. 
It was fun finding it. Don't stay up too long. You sure you got everything you want? Sure, honey. I got everything now. Good night, she said, and went out closing the door behind her. At lunch with Peter next day, John said, I wanted to get hold of Dwight to show him the draft report before I get it tight. They told me he's staying out at Harkaway with Moira's people. Peter nodded. Hmm, he's got flu. Moira rang me last night to tell me I wouldn't see him for a week, or longer if she'd got anything to do with it. I can't hold it as long as that. Jorgensen's got wind of our findings. He's saying we can't have done our job properly. I'll have to get it to the typist tomorrow at the latest. Why don't you give Moira a ring and take it out to him at Harkaway? John brightened. Yeah, I might run it out to him this afternoon in the Ferrari. Can you run that thing of yours on the road safely? Oh, yeah, it's not much else to hit, except a tram. Well, for God's sake, don't go and kill anybody. Well, they're all going to be dead in a couple of months' time anyway. I'm going to have a bit of fun in this thing first. John got to Harkaway in 23 minutes, having averaged 72 miles an hour, and drew up at the homestead in a roaring skid. Grazier, with his wife and daughter, came out and watched him as he got out stiffly. I came to see Dwight, he said. They told me he was here. Got a report here. He's got to look over it before it gets tight. Maury led the way to the spare bedroom. Dwight was awake and sitting up in bed. I guessed it must be you. You kill anybody yet? Not yet. I'm hoping to be the first. I'd hate to spend the last days of my life in prison, he explained his errand. Dwight took the report and read it through, asking a question now and again. At the end, he said, Oh, it's okay. Can I see that Ferrari from the window? Yeah, it's just outside. The captain got out of bed and went to the window. That's a hell of a car, he said. What are you going to do with it? Race it. It's what I wanted to do all me life. Is that the way you're going to make it in the end? It's what I like to do, but I hate to smash up the Ferrari. She's such a lovely bit of work. The captain turned to John. There is no chance of it easing up and giving us a break, is there? John shook his head. Absolutely none. If anything, it seems to be coming a little faster. The end of August seems to be the time. There was a pause. I kind of envy you having that Ferrari. I'll be worrying and working right up to the end. You ought to take some leave, see a bit of Australia. There's still the mountain parts at Mount Buller in Hotham. Say, um, don't people go trout fishing up in those mountains? Yeah, fishing's quite good, but the season doesn't open until September the 1st. Oh, it's running it kind of fine. I certainly would like a day or two trout fishing, but from what you say, we might be busy just around that time. I shouldn't think it would make any odds if you went up a fortnight early this year. Oh, I would like to do a thing like that in the States, yes, but when you're in a foreign country, I think a fellow should stick by the rules. John gathered up his papers and said goodbye. As he left, he met Moira. How do you think he was? she asked. Oh, he's all right. Just a bat or two flying around the belfry. Well, what about? He wants a couple of days trout fishing before we all go home, but he won't go before the season opens, and that's not until September the 1st. Well, what of it? He's keeping the law anyway, more than you are with that disgusting car. A fortnight later, Mr. Alan Sykes, director of the State Fisheries and Game Department, walked into the pastoral club and found Sir Douglas Frood. Good morning, Douglas. Didn't I hear you say that uh, Bill Davison was a relation of yours? The old man nodded shakily. Do you know his daughter, Moira? Nice girl, but she drinks too much. Well, she's been making some trouble for me. She's been to the minister. She wants us to open the trout season early this year. The minister thinks it would be a good thing and suggests August the 10th. I think it's a terrible suggestion, quite irresponsible. As member after member came into the room, the proposal was debated. Mr. Sykes found the general opinion was in favour of the change in the date. After all, said one, they're going to fish in August if they can get there. The weather's fine whether you like it or not. You can't find them or send them to jail because there won't be time to bring the case on. Mr. Sykes, having taken a cross-section of the most influential opinion of the city, went back to his office with an easier mind, rang up his minister, and that afternoon drafted an announcement to be broadcast on the radio. Dwight heard it that evening in the echoing, empty wardroom of HMA of Sydney and immediately began making plans to try out Junior's rod. 
The last part of July was a very pleasant time for most people. In their little garden, Mary and Peter laid out the new beds and built a fence around the vegetable garden, planting a passion fruit vine to climb over it. In the city mews, John worked on a Ferrari with a small team of enthusiasts. The date of the Australian Grand Prix had been advanced to August the 17th, and it had been decided that the race should take place at the track at Turidin. Rather unexpectedly, it attracted an enormous entry of 280 cars, and for two weekends previous to the great day, illuminating heats were held in the various classes. From the start of the first heat, it was evident that the racing was to be unusual, and that the drivers intended to show no mercy to their engines, their competitors, or themselves. John's race was the last of the day. Peter said thoughtfully, They're certainly racing to win. Well, of course, said John. It's racing as it ought to be. If you buy it, you've got nothing to lose, except to smash up the Ferrari. John nodded. I'd be very sorry to do that. The next two heats produced nine crashes, four ambulance cases, but only one death. Although John had what was probably the fastest car on the circuit, he'd almost the least experience of any of the drivers. He still raced the Ferrari with the three broad bands of tape across the back that indicated a novice driver. When his crew pushed the Ferrari out on the grid, he thought, this is where I get killed. Better than vomiting to death in a sick misery in less than a month's time. The big steering wheel was a delight to handle. The crack of the Ferrari's exhaust, music to his ears. He turned and grinned at his pit crew in sheer pleasure, and then fixed his eyes upon the starter. He made a good start, spun off the track on the eighth lap, but was able to get going again after wheel change and ended in second place. Of the eleven starters in the heat, eight had failed to complete the course, and three of them had been killed. On the first day of August, the radio announced with studied objectivity cases of radiation sickness in Adelaide and Sydney. The news did not trouble Mary particularly. What was important was that her first narcissi were in bloom, and the daffodils behind them were already showing flower buds. They're going to be a picture, she said happily to Peter. There are so many of them. They're going to look marvellous in a year or two. Her one trouble upon that perfect day was that Jennifer was cutting her first tooth and was hot and fractious. After a restless night with the child crying all the time, Peter felt he couldn't stand much more of it. Look, dear, he said to Mary, I'm terribly sorry, but I've got to go up to the Navy Department this morning. He drove to Williamstown and found Dwight on the bridge deck of the submarine. Peter saluted him formally. Morning, sir. Came here to see what's doing. Also, I wanted to get in touch with John and get the latest gen. Ah, uh, he'll be working on that car. You driving back to Melbourne now? It's nothing to do here, so I'll thumb a ride to town with you if I may. Forty minutes later, they were talking to John in the Mews garage. When is the Grand Prix to be run? Dwight asked. I have a bit of a row with them over that. I think Saturday fortnight, the 17th, is too late. I think we ought to run it on Saturday week, the 10th. Getting kind of close, is it? Well, I think so. After all, they've got definite cases in Canberra now. I hadn't heard of that. The radio said Adelaide and Sydney. Well, the radio is always about three days late. They don't want to create alarm and despondency until they've got to. But there's a suspect case in Albury today. Well, that's only about 200 miles north. Peter asked, How long do you think we've got then, John? The scientist glanced at him. I've got it now. You've got it. We've all got it. This door, this spanner. Everything's touched with radioactive dust. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the lettuce and the salad, even the bacon and eggs. It's getting down now to the tolerance of the individual. Some people with less tolerance than others could quite easily be showing symptoms in a fortnight's time. Dwight left them to lunch with Moira, and John suggested he and Peter lunch at the pastoral club. As they went, Peter asked, How's your uncle getting on? Well, <laughs> he's made a big hole in the port, him and his coppers. I think he'll stay the course. The port will probably give him longer than most of us. Alcohol taken internally seems to increase the tolerance to radioactivity. You mean if you get pickled, you last longer? Ah, a few days. My Uncle Douglas, it's a toss-up which will kill him first. Last week I thought the port was winning, but when I saw him yesterday, he looked pretty good. 
they found Sir Douglas Froude sitting in the garden room. How are you feeling now, sir? John asked. Mm, so, so. I hear you won that murder race you were going in for. I didn't win it, I was second. Means I got a place in the Grand Prix. Well, no go and kill yourself. That doesn't seem to matter very much if you do. Tell me, somebody was saying they've got it in Cape Town. You think that's true? His nephew nodded. Uh, looks as though all Africa might be gone in a week or so. It's a bit difficult because when more than half the people in the place are dead, the communications usually go out. And then you don't quite know what's happening. All services are usually stop by then and food supplies. The last half seemed to go quite quickly. Well, I think that's a good thing, the general said robustly. So, all of Africa is out. Does that mean that we're going to be the last? Well, not quite. We're going to be the last major city. We've got cases now in Buenos Aires and uh, Montevideo, and they've got a case or two in Auckland. After we're gone, Tasmania may last another fortnight, and the South Island of New Zealand. The last of all to die will be the Indians in Tierra del Fuego. Of course, uh, that's not the end of life upon Earth. You mustn't think that. There'll be life here in Melbourne long after we're gone. They stared at him. What life? Peter asked. John grinned broadly. The rabbit. That's the most resistant animal we know about. The general pushed himself upright in his chair, his face suffused with anger. You mean to say the rabbit's going to live longer than we do? Well, that's right. About a year longer. It's got about twice the resistance that we've got. Dogs will outlive us. Mice will last a lot longer, but uh, not so long as rabbits. Well, they'll all go in the end, of course. There'll be nothing left alive here by the end of next year. In the restaurant, Moira and Dwight ordered lunch. When it came, she said, Dwight, I had an idea. They're opening the trout fishing early this year on Saturday week. I was wondering if you'd like to take me out to the mountains for the weekend. For the fishing, Dwight, not for anything else. He hesitated. Well, that's the day that John thinks they'll be running the Grand Prix. Well, would you rather see that? No, no. No, I don't want to see it. Maybe see John get killed. I'd rather go fishing. There's just one thing, honey. I wouldn't want to go if it was going to mean that you'd get hurt. I shan't get hurt. Not in the way you mean. Well, you know the way it is. I've got a wife at home I love, and I played straight with her the two years I've been away. I wouldn't want to spoil that now, these last few days. I know. I've known that all the time. I wouldn't want to start a smutty love affair when I'm dying in a week or ten days' time. I've got some standards, too. Now, anyway. He smiled at her. We could try out Junior's rod. Well, that's what I thought. I've got a little fly rod I could bring, but I'm no good. Shall I ring up and make a booking at the hotel for two rooms? We can take my father's guy. I won't be using it. He wants to fence along the wood in the forty acre while there's still time. Well, I could come out and lend a hand if he'd like that. I'll tell him. I must go now. I've got a typing and shorthand test this afternoon. I'll give you a ring tonight, about eight o'clock. After she'd left him, he stood in the street, completely at a loose end. At Williamstown, there was absolutely nothing for him to do. The aircraft carrier was dead, and though he would not admit it, he knew his ship's working life was over. He turned and walked towards the mews garage. The streets were dirty now, and littered with paper and spoiled vegetables. The whole city was becoming foul and beginning to smell. As he'd hoped, he found John working there with two others and Peter washing strange, nameless parts of the Ferrari in a bath of kerosene. There was an atmosphere of cheerful activity that warmed his heart. I thought we might see you, John said. Come for a job? Sure. You got anything I can do? He rolled up his sleeves and turned to Peter. He got you working too? Peter nodded. I'll have to go before very long. Jennifer's teething and been crying for two bloody days. I told Mary I was sorry I'd got to go on board today, but I promised to be back by five. White smiled. Left her to hold the baby, huh? When Peter got back to his flat, he found Mary in the lounge, the house miraculously quiet. How's Jennifer? he asked. She put a finger to his lips. She's sleeping, she whispered. She went off after dinner, and she hasn't woken up since. Later, over drinks, she said, Peter, now that we've got the petrol, couldn't we have a motor mower? And another thing, 
I was thinking how nice it would be if we had a garden seat in that sheltered corner, just by the arbutus. Well, that's not a bad idea. But let's get the motor mower first and see what the bank looks like. He drove her up to Melbourne the next day to look for a motor mower, and they took Jennifer and her carrying basket on the back seat. It was some weeks since Mary had been in the city, and its aspect startled and distressed her. Peter, what's the matter with everything? It's all so dirty and it smells horrid. Well, everything's just slowing down. He could not elucidate it any further. They drove to a big hardware store and went through to the gardening department. They picked a little twelve-inch mower. I'll take this one. Okay, good little mower, that. The assistant grinned sardonically. Last you a lifetime. Can I pay by check? You can pay by orange peel for all I care. We're closing down tonight. Mary shivered. Peter, let's get out of this and go home. It's horrid here and everything smells. I don't think I want to come to Melbourne again. Hmm, getting a bit piggy, isn't it? It's horrible, she said vehemently. Everything's shut up and dirty and stinking. It's as if the end of the world had come already. It's pretty close, you know. She was silent for a moment. I know. That's what you've been telling me all along. She raised her eyes to his. How far off is it, Peter? Three weeks after the first case, though it's possible to get it slightly and get over it. But you get it again ten days or a fortnight later. There's no guarantee, then, that uh, you or I would get it at the same time, or Jennifer. We might, any of us, get it any time. He nodded. That's the way it is. We've just got to take it as it comes. Dwight spent the weekend with the Davidsons at Harkaway, working from dawn to dusk on the construction of the fences. He stayed until the Tuesday morning, and then went back to Williamstown. On Friday, he went to the Mews garage and found John working on the Ferrari, as he'd expected. See, I'd just call in and say I'm sorry that I won't be there to see you win tomorrow. I've got another date up in the mountains going fishing. John nodded. Moira told me. I don't think there'll be many people there this time, except competitors and doctors. Maybe the last begin in full health for a lot of people. They've got other things that they want to do. End of the month still? Hmm, sooner than that for most of us. He said something in a low tone and added, Keep that under your hat. Bring me back a fish. Dwight got to Harkaway in the middle of the morning. Moira was ready for him, a little suitcase stowed on the back seat with a good deal of fishing gear. I thought we'd get away before lunch and have beer and sandwiches on the road. They reached the hotel at Jameson just before dusk. It was well that they'd booked rooms, for the place was crowded with fishermen, and the bar room, where there was a huge fire of logs, was a seething mass of people. They went out next day after breakfast. The river was high and the water clouded. Moira dabbled her flies amateurishly in the quick water and did no good, but Dwight caught a two-pounder with a spinning tackle. About noon, one of the fishermen they'd met the previous evening came walking down the bank and stopped to speak to them. Ah, you won't do much good with fly in this water. Look, um, try this. He produced a tiny fly spoon. Try that in the pool where the quick water runs out. I should come for that in a day like this. Dwight tied it on for Moira and on the fifth or sixth cast there was a sudden pluck on the line, the rod bent, and the reel sang as the line ran out. She gasped, I believe I've got one, Dwight. Five minutes later she got the fish into the bank, and he netted it for her. After lunch at the hotel they went out again. They each caught a fish, and then, pleasantly tired and well content, they sat against a boulder by the river, enjoying the last of the sunlight before it sank behind the hill. A sudden thought struck Moira. Dwight, that motor race must be over by this time. Holy smoke, I meant to listen to it on the radio. I forgot all about it. They hurried back to the hotel, and presently the news came on, mostly concerned with sport. As they sat tense, the announcer said, The Australian Grand Prix was run today at Turidan and was won by Mr. John Osborne driving a Ferrari. The race was marred by the large number of accidents and casualties. Of the eighteen starters, only three finished the race of eighty laps, six of the drivers being killed outright, and many more were moved to hospital with severe injuries. 
The winner, Mr. John Osborne, is an official of the CSIRO. He has no connection with the motor industry and races as an amateur. I'm glad John got what he wanted, Moira said. Must kind of round things off for him. Dwight, I think I'd like to go home tomorrow. We've had a lovely day up here, but there's so much to do and now so little time to do it in. He nodded. I didn't want to spoil the trip for you, but John told me yesterday before we came away that they'd got several cases of this radiation sickness in Melbourne as of Thursday night. I'd say there'd be a good many more by now. On Tuesday morning, Peter went to Melbourne. Dwight had telephoned to meet him at 10.45 in the anteroom to the office of the first naval member. The radio that morning announced for the first time the incidence of radiation sickness in the city. It was no longer a matter of days now. It was coming down to hours. He did not know what this conference was to be about, but it was very evident that it would be one of the last naval duties of his career. He found Dwight in uniform and alone in the Navy Department. The door into the Admiral's office opened, and Sir David Hartman stood there. A smiling, rubicund face was serious and drawn. He said, Come in, gentlemen. My secretary isn't here today. When they were seated, he asked, what is it you want, Commander? Dwight hesitated for a moment. Ah, uh, it seems that I am the senior executive officer of the U.S. Navy now. You'll excuse me if I don't put this in the right form of language, sir, but um, I have to tell you that I'm taking my ship out of your command. The Admiral nodded slowly. Very good, Commander. Do you wish to leave Australian territorial waters or stay here as our guest? I'll be taking my ship outside territorial waters. I can't just say when I'll be leaving, but probably before the weekend. Do you expect to be returning to Australian waters? Uh, no, sir. As you know, when Montevideo went out, I ordered the captain of Swordfish to take her into deep water and sink her. I'm taking my ship out in Bass Strait to sink her. I think the Navy Department would not want me to leave ships full of classified gear kicking around. Peter had expected that, but the imminence and the practical negotiation of the matter came with a shock. The Admiral said, I should probably do the same in your shoes. A sudden spasm of pain twisted his face and he gripped a pencil on the desk before him. Excuse me, I'll have to leave you for a minute. He left them hurriedly and the door closed behind him. When the captain and the liaison officer had stood up at his sudden departure. They remained standing, staring out of the window. Finally, the Admiral reappeared, grey-faced. He did not resume his seat. This is the end of a long association, Captain, he said. We British have always enjoyed working with Americans, especially upon the sea. All I can do now is to say goodbye. They shook hands and left the office, walking through the desolate, empty building to the courtyard. When will you be sailing? Peter asked. I wouldn't know exactly. I've got seven cases in the crew as of this morning. I guess we'll stick around a day or two and sail maybe on Saturday. How many going with you? Mm, ten, eleven with myself. Are you all right so far? I thought I was, but now I don't just know. I won't be taking any lunch today. How are you feeling? I'm all right. So is Mary, I, I think. There was nothing more for them to say or do. They shook hands got into their cars, and drove off on their separate ways. Tuesday night was a disturbed night for the Holmeses. The baby began crying at about two in the morning, and it cried almost incessantly till dawn. There was little sleep for the young father or mother. At about seven o'clock, it vomited. Outside it was raining and cold. They faced each other in the grey light, weary and unwell themselves. Mary said, Peter, you don't think this is it, do you? I thought we'd be all right out here in the country. He didn't know what he could say to comfort her, so he said, If I put the kettle on, would you like a cup of tea? She forced a smile. That'd be lovely. She was feeling terrible, and now she wanted to be sick. While Peter was in the kitchen, she could go quietly to the bathroom without his knowing. Peter plugged in the kettle and switched it on. Suddenly he felt hot, and he knew he was going to be sick. He went quietly to the bathroom, but the door was locked. Mary must be in there. No point in alarming her. 
We went out of the back door in the rain and vomited in a secluded corner behind the garage. When he came back, he was white and shaken. The kettle was boiling and he made the tea and took it to their bedroom. Mary was there, bending over the cot. He poured out the two cups and presently said, Come and have your tea, dear. It's getting cold. She came a little reluctantly and, glancing at him, saw his dressing gown was soaking wet. Peter, you're all wet. Have you been outside? I had to go. I'd just been sick. Oh, Peter, so have I. She raised her eyes to his. This is the end of it, isn't it? I mean, we just go on getting sicker till we die. I think that's the form. He smiled at her. I've never done it before, but um, they say that's what happens. She went to the French windows and looked out in the garden that she loved so much. I wish we'd got the garden seat, she said irrelevantly. Would have been lovely just there, beside that bit of wall. Oh, I could have a stab at getting one. I'll see how I'm feeling later on. He went off to have a shower, and when he came back, she was in the kitchen, singing. You sound cheerful, he remarked. She came to him. It's such a relief, she said, and now he saw that she'd been crying as she sang. I've been so terribly worried, but now it's going to be all right. What's been worrying you? he asked gently. People get this thing at different times. I might have got it first, and had to leave you, or Jennifer, or you might have got it and left us alone. But now we've got it all together. On the same day, aren't we lucky? On the Friday, Peter drove up to Melbourne, ostensibly to try and find a garden seat. But he wanted to see John without delay. He tried the garage first, and then the CSIRO offices. Finally, he found him at the pastoral club, looking weak and ill. John, I'm sorry to worry you. How are you feeling? Oh, I've got it. I've had it two days, haven't you? Well, that's what I wanted to see you about. Mary and I both started on Tuesday. She's pretty bad, but yesterday... I began picking up. I didn't tell her, but I'm feeling fit as a flea now and bloody hungry. I stopped at a cafe on the way up and had breakfast, and I'm still hungry. I believe I'm getting well. Look, can that happen? Nah, not permanently. You can recover for a bit, but then you get it again. Well, how long is a bit? Well, you might get ten days. I don't think there's a second recovery. Nobody survives this thing and makes a clean sweep. When Peter had gone... John looked into the garden room, where his uncle was sitting alone, a glass of sherry by his side. He glanced up and said, Good morning, John. How are you? Oh, I'm getting pretty sick. The old man raised his flushed, rubicund face in concern. My dear boy, I'm sorry to hear that. What a pity. I was hoping you'd be here to help us out with the port. We're on the last bin now. How are you feeling yourself, uncle? Never better, my boy. Never better. John left the club and walked down the tree-lined street in a dream. The Ferrari was urgently in need of his attention. He passed the open door of a chemist shop, hesitated, and then went in. The shop was unattended, but a heap of the little red cartons had been piled untidily upon the counter. He picked one up, put it in his pocket, and went on his way. When he pushed back the sliding doors of the muse garage, the Ferrari stood facing him. It was a glorious possession to him still, the more so since the race. He hung his jacket on a nail and started to work on it. Between the spasms which shook him, he jacked up the wheels, opened a cock to drain the water from the cooling system, and then detached the terminals from the battery and greased the connections. He took out each of the six sparking plugs and filled the cylinders with oil, and screwed the plugs back finger tight. Exhausted, he rested against the car. She would be all right now. There was no more to be done to preserve her. But he was reluctant to leave. For the last time, he would sit in the driving seat and handle the controls. He put his helmet on and hung the goggles around his neck. Then he climbed into the seat and settled down behind the wheel. It was comfortable there. The wheel beneath his hands was comforting. This car had won for him the race that was the climax of his life. Why trouble to go further? He took the red carton from his pocket, put the tablets in his mouth, and swallowed them with an effort. Peter left the club and drove to the hardware store where he'd bought the motor mower. It was untenanted and empty of people. 
He found a garden seat with a brightly colored detachable cushion that he thought would please Mary. He dragged it to the car, heaved it on the roof, lashed it in place, and set off for home. He was still ravenously hungry and feeling very well. He had not told Mary anything of his recovery, and he did not intend to do so. It would only upset her, confident as she now was that they were all going together. When he got back to the flat, he found Mary lying on the bed, half-dressed, with an eider down over her. How are you feeling? he asked. Awful. Peter, I'm so worried about Jennifer. I can't get her to take anything at all, and she's messing all the time. He crossed the room and looked at the baby. It seemed to him that both it and Mary were very ill. Peter, how are you feeling yourself? Not too good. He smiled down at her. I got you the garden seat, anyway. You lie there and keep warm. I'm going to light the fire and make the house cozy. An hour later, he had a blazing fire in their sitting room, and the garden seat was set up by the wall where she wanted it to be. She came to it from the French window. It's lovely. It's exactly what we needed for that corner. It's going to be awfully nice to sit there on a summer evening. She wrapped her dressing gown around her. I'm so cold. If I mixed you a hot brandy and lemon, could you manage that? When he came back with it, he found her standing by the cart, stroking her baby's forehead. Peter, I believe she's dying. He led her from the cart to the warmth of the huge fire and gave her the hot drink of brandy and water and mixed one for himself. They sat in silence for a few minutes. Then she said, Peter, why did all this happen to us? Couldn't anyone have stopped it? I don't know. Some kinds of silliness you just can't stop. I mean, if a couple of hundred million people decide that their national honor requires them to drop cobalt bombs upon their neighbor, um, there's not much that you or I can do about it. The only possible hope would be to educate them out of their silliness. But how could you have done that? Newspapers. You could have done something with newspapers. We didn't do it. No nation did. We liked our newspapers with pictures of beach girls and uh, headlines about cases of indecent assault. And no government was wise enough to stop us having them that way. I'm glad we haven't got newspapers now. It's been much nicer without them. A spasm shook her, and he helped her to the bathroom. While she was in there, he stood, looking at his baby. He was in a bad way. He doubted if it would live through the night. Mary was in a bad way, too. The thought of living on after Mary appalled him. He wanted to stay with his family. When Mary came back, she said, There's no hope at all, is there, for any of us? He shook his head. Nobody gets over this one, dear. I don't believe I'll be able to get to the bathroom tomorrow. Peter, dear, I th think I'd like to have it tonight and take Jennifer with me. Would you think that beastly? He kissed her. I think it's sensible. I'll come too. What do we do, Peter? He thought for a moment. I'll go and fill the hot water bags and put them in the bed. Then you put on a clean nightie and go to bed and keep warm. I'll bring Jennifer in there. Then I'll shut up the house and bring you a hot drink and, and we'll have it in bed together. With the pill. Remember to turn off the electricity at the main. I mean, mice can chew through a cable and set the house on fire. I'll do that. She looked up at him with tears in her eyes. Will you do what has to be done for Jennifer? He stroked her hair. Don't worry, I'll do that. He filled a thermos jug with boiling water, put it on a tray with two glasses, the brandy and half a lemon, and took it into the bedroom. Then he wheeled the cot in and put it by the bedside. Would you like to hold the baby for a little? She shook her head. She's too ill. I'd rather think about her, like she was. Give her the thing, Peter, and let's get this all over. She was right, he thought. It was better to do things quickly and not agonize about them. He gave the baby the injection, undressed, and put on clean pajamas. He put up the fire screen in the sitting room, lit a candle, put it on the table by their bed, and then turned off the current at the main. He got into bed with Mary, mixed the drinks, and took the tablets out of the red cartons. I've had a lovely time since we got married, she said quietly. 
Thank you for everything, Peter. He drew her to him and kissed her. I've had a grand time, too. Let's end on that. They put the tablets in their mouths and drank. That evening, Dwight rang Moira at Harkaway. Say, um, how are things with you, honey? Bad. I think Mommy and Daddy are just about through. And you? I, I'm just about through, too, Dwight. How are you? I'd say I'm much the same. We're taking Scorpion out tomorrow morning to sink her. I wanted to say goodbye and thank you for the last six months. It's, it's meant a lot to me having you near. It's meant a lot to me, too. Dwight, um, if I can make it, may I come and see you off? He hesitated. Well, sure. We can't wait, though. The men are pretty weak right now, and they'll be weaker by tomorrow. Well, what, what time are you leaving? Well, we're casting off about eight o'clock, as soon as it's full daylight. I'll be there. He rang off, and she went through to her father and mother's bedroom and told them what she wanted to do. Her mother said, well, You must go and say goodbye to him, dear. He's been such a good friend for you. But if we're not here when you come back, you must understand. We've got everything we need in case it gets too bad. From his bed, her father said weakly, Would you go out and open the stockyard gate into the lane? All the other gates are open. But they must be able to get at the hay. I'll do that right away, Daddy. He closed his eyes. Um... Uh, Give Dwight my regards. I wish he'd been able to marry you. So do I. But he's the kind of man who doesn't switch easily. She went to bed, setting her alarm for five o'clock. She slept very little. When the alarm went off, she had a shower and dressed in the red shirt and slacks that she'd worn when she first met Dwight so many months ago. She looked in on her parents. Her father seemed to be asleep, but her mother smiled at her from the bed. She went in quietly and kissed her. Then she took a bottle of brandy from the larder and went out to the car. She came to the dockyard at about quarter past seven, drove straight to the quay beside which lay the aircraft carrier, and walked onto the ship. She stopped a man on his way down to the submarine. If you see Captain Towers, would you ask him if he could come up and have a word with me? Presently, Dwight came up the gangway to her. He took her hands. It was nice of you to come and say goodbye. How are things at home, honey? Very bad. Dwight, may I come with you? I don't believe that I'll have anything at home to go back to. He stood silent for so long that she knew the answer would be no. I've been asked the same thing by four men this morning. I've refused them all because Uncle Sam wouldn't like it. I've run this vessel in the naval way right through and... Uh, I'm running it that way up to the end. I can't take you, honey. We'll each have to take this on our own. He touched her arm. You're wearing the same outfit you wore the first time we met. She smiled faintly, and he took her in his arms and kissed her. And she clung to him for a minute. Then she freed herself. What time are you leaving? We'll be casting off in about five minutes. What time will you be sinking her? He thought for a moment. Say, uh, two hours and ten minutes after we cast off. I'll be thinking of you. Maybe I'll see you in Connecticut one day. He nodded slowly and said, Thanks for everything. And then turned and went down the gangway to the submarine. She watched as it went slow astern in a great arc away from the carrier, and gradually vanished in the murk. She then hurried out through the dim, echoing caverns of the dead aircraft carrier to the quay and her car. Once on the highway, she went flying down the unobstructed road in the direction of Geelong. She slowed a little to pass through the city and then headed towards the headland. At about twenty minutes to ten, the sea again lay before her. She parked and scanned the horizon for the submarine, as she turned towards the lighthouse on Point Lonsdale, she saw the low grey shape appear, barely five miles away, and heading southwards from the heads. She could not see detail, 
but he knew that Dwight was there upon the bridge, taking his ship out on its last cruise. She knew he could not see her, and he could not know that she was watching, but she waved to him. Then she got back into the car, because the wind was raw and chilly from south polar regions, and she was feeling very ill, and she could watch him just as well when sitting down in shelter. She sat there, dumbly watching, as the low grey shape went forward to the mist on the horizon, holding the bottle on her knee. This was the end of it, the very, very end. When she could see the submarine no longer, she looked at her watch. It showed one minute past ten. She took out the red carton from her bag, opened the vial, and held the tablets in her hand. At ten past ten, she said earnestly, Dwight, if you're on your way already, wait for me. Then she put the tablets in her mouth and swallowed them down with a mouthful of brandy.